live streaming is on. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me see, as usual, if we are live on YouTube, because I don't trust this thing. <laughs> Sometimes it says we're live and we're not. So it seems we are. So again, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, because I don't, I don't know if you're watching this live or, as I used to say, non-live. I don't, doesn't mean you're a zombie. That's mean that maybe you watch it later. With us is the master, the amazing man, good friend, everything you can imagine that is a, a good a praise because he deserves all the praise. My good friend, Mr. George Pratt. How are you, George? Good. How are you? Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you deserve that and more, as I was saying. Um, how's things? How's life? How's everything in the middle of this uh, boring apocalypse uh you know for most for a lot of artists i think it's you know average days <clears throat> you know i mean it's social distancing was what we did anyway so <laughs> <laughs> going out is a little more dangerous you know so i wear a mask when i go to the grocery store and go out and whatever yeah you wear a mask oh my god I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the thing that um uh, that you miss the most um going things, out. things you know going out going to the bookstores mm -hmm. you know i still go to the art store if i need to but uh that's really about it i mean i you know again it was like mostly stay at home and draw and paint you know mm -hmm. uh did you miss uh going to the movies at all or you are not a movie guy no i'm a total movie guy but honestly like i have a really big tv and I don't miss going to the theater. I mean, I do, but when I go, it's like it costs so much money. So, the, whoops, that's why I'm sorry. The tickets are the cheapest thing there, and if you get a drink and you get, you know, popcorn or whatever, it's like it breaks the bank. So, and you got people crinkling things and making noise and all this. And if I go home, I've got a screen that's, you know, mm -hmm. aspect-wise the same size and. I can I can pause it and I can <laughs> so I don't miss it that much you know. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what was the last movie you went to a theater to watch? Oh man, uh, my daughter and I went to see. What did we go see? Nineteen seventeen or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? What did you think of the photography in that one? Um. Well, I, I love the, the the sort of seamless blending of the cuts. You know, I thought that was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the movie itself, I you know, I thought it was good, but it didn't it didn't like blow me away. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I think what had a bigger impact on me was the uh, "They Shall Not Grow Old," the uh, Peter Jackson documentary. Oh yes, and that uh, in the theater was awesome with the 3d and I'm not a big 3d fan mm -hmm. that really worked. I was just like, Whoa, you know, I thought it was excellent. Yeah. I was asking because I love Roger Dickens, you know, the, the DP, uh, yeah. I, think, I think he's a genius. So he's one of the guys where I would want to watch the movie just because I, I hear, you know, Janusz Kaminski or himself like, Oh, yep. this guy's the DP of the movie. Like, okay, I'm going. Yeah. Oh, the movie is going to be crap. Yeah, you know, but it has Roger Dickens, he has Storaro, or it has, you know, Janusz Kaminski, or those guys like, yeah, well, you know what? For once, I don't care. I just, these guys yeah. are too good. You, you got to see what they do because it's hard. Yeah. Well, it's right? like, uh, yeah, or watch for me too, like watching a film edited by like Walter Murch or someone like that. Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And what are you watching at home? Since you have that. Huge TV. <laughs> oh, what do I watch at home? Yeah, well, I go on Apple and I'll buy I'll buy movies, you know. Um, and I did buy 1917. I bought They Shall Not Grow Old because it's great reference, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, man, a little of everything. I mean, I go way back to like you know uh, some of the silent films. I'll buy some of those. I'll get. Uh, I'm a big fan of like. African Queen and you know these old I love these old films you know and I buy a lot of films too that I may not necessarily like the, the film the story or whatever but visually they're stunning 
Mm -hmm. And I like to freeze frame and draw from them, you know? Yeah. I do, I do that pretty often. Yeah, but, I, have, I don't know if it's happened to you too, but uh, during this pandemic, for whatever reason, I got so saturated with Netflix and all because they have so many things that like in 30 seconds, I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I don't want to keep scrolling. So I won't go back to my library of, of you know, I classic classic films yeah. and just go there and start like, oh, today's a day for German expressionism to say something or today's John Ford or today's David Lean or whatever. Yeah. And, and then just stop and like, I watched this movie a thousand times and you just can't stop. That's why I watch them alone because Paloma could kill me as you can imagine. I start freeze framing, you know, just to, or go back and back and back just to analyze how they did it. Yeah. And like, oh, so, oh, Christopher Nolan does that or whatever guy or Spielberg. Like, okay, yeah. Spielberg, it's, yeah, it's obvious you like David Lean. Or, oh, Christopher Nolan, oh, it's obvious you like Kubrick. You know what I mean? Uh, you go back and watch this and see where all the references are, are taken from. That's right. Was it, so David Lean, was he uh, um, Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah, Lawrence of Arabia, Bridge Over River Kwai, uh, yeah. Brief Encounter, Sibago, of course. Uh, yeah, so the... the, the the two classic, the two classic masters of uh, of the epic scope, uh, yep. are, are usually considered, you know, C. B. De Mille, yeah, and uh, and David Lean. And I think David Lean is the guy who created the blockbuster as we know it, because yep. everything you see now, I would say, well, him and Kurosawa. Let's be honest. Oh yeah, <laughs> everything you've seen afterwards, you know, like Spielberg, Lucas, and all those guys. Yeah. You go back and watch David Lean, or you go back and watch Kurosawa, and it's yep. like. I'm sorry to say it for you fans of those guys, it's all there. Yeah. And the good thing is like, uh, you know, Spielberg and, and Lucas at least cop to it and they like promote that, which is yeah. cool. Like they, they own it on their, yeah. sleeve, on their sleeve, which is cool. And they also, you know, recognize these are my guys, you know, like, no, like not yeah. like others, you know, Spielberg has always said David Lean and the others, Lucas yeah. even produced Kurosawa's movies when Kurosawa couldn't make them. Right. So, you know, Scorsese is a, is a huge um, movie scholar, you know, because always spent a lot of money, of his own money, restoring all movies. Yeah. So that generation, the part that I love the most about them is that they've never denied their influences. And yeah. they've always said, we learn from them and we got to, you know, keep that legacy, legacy together. So yeah. in terms of all those um, classic directors, or even not even classic directors, classic uh, um, a style of making movies, yeah. what, what would you consider is your, um, are your influences in a way? Well, that's the beauty of the Lean films is that he really took the time to get there. You know what I mean? It wasn't just this yeah. stuff, you know? There was this, I mean, the epic, compositions are one thing but it was also the, the the scope of the film was slow and like you had to, he immersed you in these in these places and, and events you know which is uh well that in 1917 sort of had that feel you know uh that would drop you in and and you're slowly it's like real time which is pretty cool mm -hmm. uh, so that was yeah i mean so that i really appreciated that you know and not just Wham pal, you know, stuff going on all the time and like, you know, just trying to play with the uh, short attention span of a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, but that's also, I think that what uh, Anthony Minghella tried to do, right? I mean, with uh, English Patient right. and all the other movies he did, uh, I felt in a way that he was trying to be David Lean in terms of that scope, but at the same time, a slow brewing. Yeah. The difference is that with Minghella, sometimes I got bored as hell because it got too slow, which with Lean, I think I never got, got bored with David Lean, if yeah. you know what I mean. But yeah. uh, I love it when those guys, you know, the new directors in a way, they're not new, but you know what I mean? They just tell you, there's no rush. We'll get there. Yeah. Well, and it's funny. It's like, uh, that's a, a discussion I've had with editors sometimes in the comics is uh, they wanted the story to, to to like be really fast sort of all the time. And I said, and I said, well, but that doesn't make any sense. I said, you know, 
let's lead into this and take our time, whatever. And it's like, oh, but you know, but but the readers, I'm like, they bought a book. They know there's a story in there. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not like they're going to get gypped. It's like it, it actually adds to the overall impact and allows people to be immersed and, and sort of like slowly get into it, you know, and not just be dropped in and all of a sudden they're just flipping through this thing. I, I want them to take their time when they read it, you know? Yeah, but that's like, <laughs> let me give you an extreme exam uh, example of what I think about that. That's like expecting uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey to have battles all over pages. You know, we won't we won't tell you the story of Achilles or this story Achilles or the story of uh, Odysseus or Ulysses, whatever you want to. We just showed you the fucking battle. The rest yeah. of it, character development and all that. Why? Like yeah. why? Because if you don't develop the characters, nobody fucking cares. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for the cursing, but many yeah. times with movies, it's happen. Movies or novels or or comics or whatever the art form, they don't give you the time to care. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, literature, comics, you know, all this movies, especially literature, they're, they are manuals for empathy and for living. And, the, and if you go this route of just like, you know, it, you, you, you sidestep all of that stuff. And, and, and it's really people need this because, I mean, look at the state we're in, especially over here. You know, where no one, one, it's the, again, the short attention span, there's no empathy, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, these are, you know, things that you, you need to be taught some of this stuff and people need to be socialized and they need to have empathy with, I mean, with everybody. I mean, you know, it's like, what was it? The, uh, I don't know who said it, writer, but it was, uh, you need to be able to, as, as a writer, to inhabit the worst person in the world. Mm -hmm. and have people care about them absolutely so that when the flip is there it has impact you know and that every you know again you'll walk a mile in someone else's shoes but it's that's lost these days and it is that character development now european films have lots of this mm -hmm. and european comics have lots of this yeah what they it's they are about people and they're about real life not you know spandex beating each other up all the time and uh, it's something that's really missed here I, for me anyway you know i go to the comic shop and i'm just underwhelmed every time i go and i'm just bored you know it's like i want something i can sink my teeth into mm -hmm. and um you know i mean and again again it goes back to this writer's thing you know oh why did you write that book because i couldn't find that book mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i couldn't find the one i wanted to read so i had to write it yeah and that, that's that's a that's a real thing. Yeah. But in a way, I think I think that the, the change has already come uh, to United to American comics, and you can't stop it. I mean, I always repeat this same phrase. I had you know like six female young female creators here, Spanish ones, in like three weeks ago. Uh, we were talking about sexual identity, you know, what they want to do in this to try and, and telling their stories. And about the controversies because some of them some of them were trans some of them were you know bisexual or lesbian blah blah, blah. and then literally said in the middle of it i got angry and, and said stop it they can't stop the future you are the future they just can't they're gonna fight but you know what they fight because they know they're gonna lose yeah that's that's the whole point it's like they're scared to death they're it, this thing is like rattling their cage in such a major way and the thing that always blows my mind is like this has absolutely no impact on their lives absolutely nothing yes. and it's like and they're so scared of it and they're so they're they're so hateful about it and it's like tell me how this actually affects your life because it doesn't no it's so weird you know and i and i absolutely don't get it it's like grow up you know join join the human race and get over it <laughs> i mean it's like really bizarre yeah, but uh, for me, that's like the you know the the, the old Batman phrase that um, uh, criminals are coward and superstitious. <laughs> a cowardly and superstitious lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the exact phrase. Thank you so much for correcting me. Yeah. That, I think that applies to that people too. You know, everything they don't know, everything they haven't been educated yeah, for. Yeah. You know, they're they're like the sheep that w with Trump. You know, yeah. they would all be said, jump there and die. 
after that hill. There's a precipice. You're gonna die. They will jump. <laughs> yeah. Because you know they don't they don't know better. They haven't been teach to know better. So yeah. of course everything that goes out of that square frame of mind, you know, like they have this box. Right. Sorry, Thanos, but you know what? This these have this box, and everything that is out of this box makes them make them scared. Yeah. They don't understand it, so they're gonna jump and react like, "Oh my God!" And like, no, nobody wants to change you. Like, I uh, years ago in Spain, when you know, um, gay marriage. I think was the first, the best, the first uh, country in the world who approved, you know, uh, countrywide gay marriage. Um, I've just started to hear things like, "Oh, they're going to approve pedophilia," pedophilia uh, and they're like, "Wait, wait, 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 <laughs> what?" <laughs> You're gonna really go there? It's like. And the people that are, you know, and again, it's projection. That's the absolutely, really good. yeah, that, yeah. That's just like when priests, you know, complain about all those things. Oh, you know, the uh, girls shouldn't have the short curves. They are provoking. It's like they are provoking who? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. It's you thinking about provoking you. Yeah. So anyway, but we were talking about art. No, what I, what I meant with American comics is that more and more you see the real sales. I mean, I see Tilly Walden, or I see what other people do. They are not going to sell in comic stores. Yeah. Fine. But the last book uh, by Tilly Walden sold a million copies. Wow. Which is what, how, what I always say. When they tell me there's no, there's no readers, I always go back and say, no, 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 no. Stop. There is readers. Yeah. But if you don't give them what they want, they are not going to buy it. Right. But if you give them what they want, they are going to buy it. It's just as simple as that. And that's what's been happening in Europe a lot, especially in Spain. When you were here, you saw it. A lot of new creators that are doing a slice of life or whatever they want to do, just literally no limits. This is the story you want to tell. Yeah. And they're selling like hotcakes in Spain and in Europe. And I think it's the same in America. If you and other creators working for book publishers in a big way, just do what you want, the readers are going to be there. Yeah, the tough thing is, is the book publishers won't go there because they are there's you know again it's like well this sells really well always has and they believe it always will even though their numbers have been dwindling and you're like and like I mean I have a, you know like I have my blues book I have the Holocaust stuff uh, we did the uh, you know um, black light. In Germany, we, we it was an international project on the African genocide, and can't find publishers for these things. It's too real for them. I'm assuming mm -hmm. is part of the issue. And so, you know, uh, I'm working with uh, Kasra Ganbari, mm -hmm. uh, who did 44 Flood and you know the um, Tome books, to uh, do a series of books on my of my projects. You know, and finally try and just get these things out uh, as Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. But that's that's literally the only way some of this stuff can come out, you know, because the publishers are petrified of certain things. They just don't want to go there. I mean, I, I, I took the blues book to Abrams. Uh, Charles Kochman was a was a big uh, carrying a torch for that for a long time. And so I finally took it in and it was weird because it was like, oh, well, this isn't a picture book. And it's like it never was a picture book. <laughs> It's a it's a it's a written novel with comics and spot illustrations and recordings and you know, you no, know, so uh, yeah, so I'm gonna have to just publish these things myself, you know, um, with Casper's help. Which, but that's yeah, yeah, that's crazy. But it'll get there. We gotta trust. I think the, the market's gotta get there, whether they like it or not. They need it. Uh, yeah, they. You know, the thing is, they really need to to rethink their model. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when the when the comics implosion in the '90s, you know, and they were everybody was surprised. I'm like, how can you be surprised? You're putting out tons of crap, yep, sealed in plastic bags like it was going to be worth something, and it they were garbage, yep. And there were millions of copies, yep. It's not gonna, it's not they're not worth a dime, you know. And they would never be worth a dime. Absolutely, and they did it to themselves, and it's like no big surprise, you know. So, yeah. And there's, there's, you know, and the thing that's beautiful about a lot of the independent publishers is that they're playing with packaging, mm -hmm. you know, formats. And Absolutely. But the big companies won't go there. Marvel and DC, they won't go there. They're so wed to the, 
the pamphlet, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then they're reprints with the same size as the pamphlets. And you're like, man, people come on, you know, there's so much that can be done here. And they're just dropping the ball. Cause it's, again, that's the, the fear of the unknown, I guess. Yeah. You were here a year and a half ago and you saw how the market is. We have like a million formats because depending on the book and depending on what the story you want to tell, maybe novel size, maybe album size, maybe comic book size, even yeah. with the reprints ECCD, uh, you know, with your stuff, remember yeah. that both books, one was one format and the other one was another format because yeah. it was, this is what the readers want for this book. You know, they want it smaller for enemy ace, they want bigger for Batman or the other way around. Yeah. Because that's what you have to play with. You gotta know your reader and your reader doesn't want the same format for everything. They just don't. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm I'm someone who like if I go to the uh, the bookstore, the form I can buy a book just because of the format. Yeah, you know, as a as a designer and a you know and a lover of graphics and whatever, it's like oh my god, it's a beautiful thing, you know, and that alone can can get me, and that'll actually drive me to to read that author and, and or that or look at that artist and, and stuff like that, and it they, those things can drive new readers, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I bought a lot of photography books. I yeah. gotta say, because of the format. Oh, and the, and the quality, you know. Yeah, just because of seeing the format and like I, I, I need to work to, to keep this, you know. And then Paloma is like, but you haven't seen the interiors. Like, no, no, it's the format. It. You know, I, I need to have this in my hands and study it because they, they there, you know, they try something different. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, and they're playing with textures and and papers and yeah, I mean yeah. all that. And this is what I think is missing in comics. You know, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, you can't do, I'm sorry, you can't do enemy ace in the same format you do uh, Batman or Preacher or it, it needs another format. It's, it's for another reader. It's not the, the same guy who's gonna buy, maybe it is the same guy because <laughs> it's crossings, but you know, it normally won't be the same guy who's gonna buy an X-Men book. Yeah. The, the, the guy who buys the X-Men monthly, has his market perfect? I love X-Men comics, comic shops, whatever. Enemy Ace has to go to the go to the bookstore and to a certain other part for people to see it because they are not going to look for it in the comics area. No. You know, Charlie Adler was telling me exactly this uh, last week. The, the comics, uh, they have a comics laureate every year in, in the UK. Uh, he was the, the one the year before, and he told me that the new one, the comics laureate this year, is, is working with a comic shop, uh, sorry, with bookshops, telling them start putting all the comics together on the same area yeah get the fucking comics that are you know history put them in the history search in the history section uh you know if you want horror put them in the horror section you know get them out of the get them out of the ghetto or or at least at the very least spread it out put some in horror put some in comics and then you're catching both both readers you know exactly i open someone's you know eyes to a new a new thing but people that are actually looking for it will know they can find it where they usually go. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was disagreeing with with uh, with Charlie, and I was saying I don't want the comic section to disappear. You know, I think comics are important enough to have their own section, but you gotta divide it. You know, it's like here you have horror, here you have superheroes, here you have manga, here you have well, manga you could divide it in three thirty-seven million, but you yeah. know what I mean. Have here, 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 and that. And then spread it on the other section. I understand that. But yeah. getting the comics out of a comic session completely, sorry, no, that could be diluting our importance. That could be saying, we're afraid of being considered comic books, so we are going to take you out of that. But as you said, I think it's perfect, you know, using both both uh, both parts. So the people who want to buy them in the comic section, because they respect us, go there. And for other people who would never go to the comic section, so they can find it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, let me say hello to people so they don't think we ignore them because they are already asking things. Hello, Philippe Ebrel. Hello, Paula Ventimiglia. Paula Ventimiglia asks, I would love to know what are your what are George's uh, artistic influences, painters, comic artists, uh, artistic movements that he loves. Uh, that's oh, all he, can, he can spend uh, 45 minutes just answering this question, Paula. You're a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a lot of painters, um, obviously, like the Impressionists, uh, the Tonalists, you know, the German Expressionists. Uh, individually, like, I mean, Sargent, Whistler, Homer, uh, 
Rembrandt. You know, I mean, I could like, <laughs> that's a, that's a huge Remington. I mean, it's a huge list, you know, lots of illustrators, uh, all the, all the brandy wine, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Howard Pyle, NC Wyatt, Harvey Dunn. Uh, and then the people done taught like Dean Cornwell and Meat Schaefer go through that list. Uh, Frank Brangwen. And then you go into, you know, and that again, I could go on forever, you know, uh, modern painters, you know, uh, Bill Ray, he's great. You know, um, um, Nicholas Uribe is doing great stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go into comics. I mean, it's, it's the usual gang of idiots, you know, it's Alex Raymond, Milton Kniff, Hal Foster, Neil Adams, Frank Rosetta, Bernie Wrights, and Jeff Jones, Barry Windsor Smith, Mike Kaluta, uh, Frank Robbins, um, Alex Toth, then the Europeans, you know, Breccia. Don't forget, don't forget about Bill and uh, about Bill and uh, Ancherello. We don't we don't want them to get angry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but uh, you know, Breccia, Munoz, Battaglia. Uh, Hugo Pratt, uh, God, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Herman, um, I mean, Manara, Manara, yeah, I mean, Tardy is one of my heroes. I mean, uh, De Crecy, you know, the, the list is uh, mm-hmm. Palacios. I mean, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those. I mean, uh, there's a list that we hand out. You know, I hand out to my students like artists to study. And there's photographers, there's mm-hmm. filmmakers. And it just, you know, it's like pages and pages of, you know, I mean, it just goes on forever. <laughs> are, you, are you a Picasso guy or a Salvador Dali guy? Or a who? Salvador Dali. Dali. Uh, um, I'm like, you know, I like both of them, but they're not like high on my list. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, Dali is, the stuff is amazing, but it, but it's not, it's not, it's like weird. It's like, uh, there are artists where like, he doesn't make me want to paint, you know, and Picasso doesn't make me want to paint, but, mm-hmm. but I can appreciate the work and, and, and know like, yeah, you know, it's, it's amazing and great stuff, but it doesn't make me want to do art. You know, does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. No, with, yeah. with, with Dali, I always have the same thing. It's amazing craft, beautiful, but I always think, I'm sorry if you are a Dali fan, yeah. I'm sorry, what I'm going to say, uh, it doesn't have a soul. I always feel it's all fake. It's uh, he was so good he could create all that stuff, but it's all artificial. If you know what I mean. If I if never connected with it. With Picasso, it's a different thing because the moment you are in front of Guernica, and I think you want to watch it in Madrid, the panic, the fear, everything that he's, I like, holy shit. Yeah. If you don't like the art, you, I know there was a soul behind it, but. I am a Goja guy and a Velasquez guy in a way. So yeah. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, what else? Uh, Philippe Brel asks: Has George seen any of the British war comics? Oh yeah, um, I've got a few of them uh, in the digest forms when mm-hmm. I was in London pretty frequently. And uh, but it's funny, I can't, I can't tell you who did any of them. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, although I do have, I uh, actually that's not totally true. Is I do uh, have, and I and I know I'm going to not get the name, but Charlie's War, I have mm-hmm. all of that, and I enjoyed that. You know, mm-hmm. Felipe Velas, the the Mirage, the Mirage shot in Lawrence of Arabia of Omar Sharif coming to meet Lawrence is stunning. Yeah, taking its time, as we were saying before. You know, with David Lynn. Uh Carolina Bensler says he's an Spanish illustrator, amazing one. Uh, she says your work, your style. It's fucking amazing, George, like a dream. Thank you. Uh, Angel Perez says, Hi, Mr. Pratt. It was an honor to meet you in Heroes Con Madrid. Could you tell us what kind of research have you done, uh, did you do, in fact, to, to create such different works like Enemy Ace or Batman Har- Harvest Breed? Um, well, the, you know, it was really interesting uh, for the Enemy Ace stuff. I was a my father was in World War II in the Navy, and he was constantly reading books about that war in particular. Uh, but he also read, I mean, just tons of history and stuff. But so these books were always around the house. And I was a, a big like war junkie as a kid. And growing up in Texas, that was kind of all my friends, you know, parents were in the war and they were in various 
military services, you know, like they were grunts or they were uh, bomber and fighter pilots and, you know, all this stuff. And so we had all that gear and we used to dress up and play guns and all this stuff. And so when I began, well, and sort you know, and you got to remember like uh, my entire childhood until I was 15, there was a war going on. You know, mm-hmm. Vietnam was always there and the uh, body counts and all this stuff, you know. Um, and so I was petrified <laughs> that I would have to go to this thing. And it was, and if you think of two, uh, so in, uh, you know, when I was 15, this had gone on for that long. So it wasn't like a crazy thought that I might have to go to this thing. In three more years, mm-hmm. I would be eligible. So it was scary. And, So when I was, when I got, well, when I was in art school, I started reading lots about the Vietnam War to try and understand it, to kind of come to grips with it myself, because I used to have nightmares about this thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I, some of the first work I got when I got out of art school was working for a Vietnam veterans magazine. Mm -hmm. And um, so again, I was reading, and I was like someone who was not really into history as a kid. Like I really didn't like it because the school didn't, didn't sort of uh, make you want to like it. You know, it's like they never, it just, they never connected it to mm-hmm. people on the ground, you know? And um, so I never thought like the research would be something I would actually be interested in. And once I started diving into the first world war on top of the Vietnam stuff, man, it was just, I could not stop. And the, the research has become one of the most enjoyable aspects of what I do, Mm -hmm. uh, almost to the point of like, like I need to stop (laughs) so I can get it done, you know? But, uh, so there was that in enemy ace, you know I mean? That was, uh, and I found it was interesting because I found that the first world war stuff was what really connected. And I, and even now it's like, I can't shake it. It's like constantly, bubbling up and resurfacing for me and I keep digging and digging and digging and I've been writing forever on a, a big opus that I'd like to do someday maybe as a, a series of you know or as a magazine about the first world war and following a guy uh, through his entire tour you know but um, but whereas Batman didn't really uh, it had very little to do with research other than in this uh, you know, this weird, you know, Jack the Ripper stuff or whatever, but it was, um, Batman was the whole reason I became an artist. Mm -hmm. I I had uh, two open heart surgeries when I was a kid and I was in the hospital forever. And, uh, the Batman TV series was, that was first run, you know, and I was hooked on this thing as a kid. Like I had a inner clock, you know, that, cause I couldn't tell time. I had an inner clock that would, then I knew when to turn the TV on to watch Batman mm-hmm. in the hospital. And so my family saw me loving up on this thing and they started buying me comic books and that's how I got hooked, you know? And so Batman was, that was the whole reason I did, you know, was that was a dream project of, um, that will, and I got to do those covers, you know, earlier. Um, and that was, a uh, that was DC keeping me on the hook because when I went in and sold them on, on uh, enemy ace, um, I wouldn't start any of, I mean, I had done a ton of work on it, but not on the actual physical artwork. Um, but I, I didn't want to, I sort of refused to start until I actually got a contract, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they, and it was taking, it took them over a year to get the iron out that contract. And so they were like, Oh, do you want to do covers? It's like, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, the glory spot. So, uh, you know, man, and they let me do Batman covers. I got to do, you know, all these, these things that I love, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that I, that I, that I loved as a kid, you know, Doc Savage. And I mean, it was just, yeah, it was, a, it was like playtime, you know, and, and it kept me in money and it kept me at DC. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So the Batman project was, uh, they both were like total, uh, labors of love, you know, enemy ace was uh, interestingly enemy ace was more so uh, because of Joe Kubert and all the war comics I read as a kid. And I read enemy ace as a kid. It was just like this, you know, mind blowing thing for me. And um, the Batman book should have been like this 
wonderful trip through, you know, uh, memory lane and beyond because, you know, when you read, we all, we all read these comics and it's like, they should have had Batman do this. He should have done this. And it's like, I got to make him do these things. I always said he should do, you know, so that was cool. But, um, but I did have struggles through that book. Um, the, the editor kind of wanted me to, to re sort of redo enemy ace, you know? And I was like, man, that's, I, I didn't, I was so burned out after that book that I was like, I don't even paint that way anymore, you know? And, um, so that became a struggle and it, and it really soured uh, a lot of aspects of that book, which should have been this ultimate, you know, thing for me because of Batman, you know? Um, and then there, you know, like the, the Wolverine series, um, the research was on the front end in the sense that I was already reading all about Japanese history and Japanese ghost stories and stuff. It was an interest I had anyway. Yeah. And I was able to, to wrap it up into, you know, I never was uh, as invested in Wolverine like Batman. And, but Wolverine to me was the closest thing to Batman that DC's got. And uh, I mean, that Marvel's got. And, uh, and it was, you know, thankfully through uh, Chris Claremont that I got to do that, you know, but um, so, yeah, but, but the research is, is a, is a thing I really love, you know, I get totally wrapped up in it. And I, and I do believe like these projects take time. And I think that that is part of it, you know, that the day to day rather than just, Oh, I have an idea. Let me sell it and let me do it. Mm -hmm. I like that things take time and that life adds layers to these things, uh, daily life and things that find their way through me back, you know, back into it. Mm -hmm. that it wouldn't have otherwise. I think that's important, you know? Yeah, uh, I was thinking uh, three weeks ago, I had uh, Garth, Garth Ennis here, and he was telling me, I was asking him why why war comics, because he keeps going back and back and back, and he was telling me, because that's why I grew up with. I didn't grow up with superheroes because of the distribution, you know, uh, he left, he's from out, out of Belfast in Northern Ireland. Wow. And what we got was exactly what those, you know, small war comics we were talking about. Right. And that's how, what I grew up with, and that's my love. You know, I can do other things, uh, but that's why I keep coming back because, as other people have superheroes, I have more comics. So I'm thinking you guys should do one together. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, the, about the war comics, and um, as opposed to the superheroes, it's like the war comics. It's well, it's real. Yeah, and and it's. You know, superheroes. That it's uh, you have. There's a suspension of disbelief that you've got to go through, mm -hmm. and, and it, I'm not. And it's not hard to go through it. I mean, it's just what it is. But it's. But there's. But there's a reality to war comics when they're done. When they're done well, and I think done. You know, I'd say right. Um, that's why I never bought into the Marvel comics war books. You know, because it was too much of the snappy comebacks, and you know, <laughs> where DC was like they were heavy. You know. Not all of them. I mean, you know, they were people fighting dinosaurs and stuff. But I, that wasn't the stuff I read. I was reading Sergeant Rock and GI Combat, Haunted Tank, you know, Unknown Soldier, and these things. And and they 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 didn't like. I think you know, overtly glorify war. They always brought it home, and it was like serious stuff. And and in reality, those are, I guess, the closest thing that we have to European the human interest. Stories, you know, that mm -hmm. are, you know. Um, well, and our, our buddy that, you know, I got to see when I came to visit was Don McGregor. Uh, yeah. And these are people, you know, he was able to take heroes and give us that. Yes. Which was, you know, Denny O'Neill was able to do that too. Absolutely. You know? um, and those are the people, like, again, you know, these people, they molded me big time. You know, because they were writing stories about inclusion and about reality, and you know, the like, yeah, they wrapped it into this fantasy world, but they really did, you know, give me a conscience yep. and give me, you know, uh, empathy for all people. You know, yep. it's like, wow, you know, that's and that's power. You know, it's fun when when you ask them, you know, like Don or or Danny or others. We, they always say if a Stan hadn't done it before with the with the, with the Spider-Man drug comic, you know, just telling to the comics called "fuck you," I'm gonna publish it anyway. 
Yeah. If he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be able to do to, to do it ourselves. That's he, right. If he opened that door because he was, uh, sorry to say, fucking Stan Lee, and he didn't in Spider Man, he didn't do it in in in, he did it in the best selling comic. And they're like we could do it because we did. We wouldn't have never been able if he right. stand, you know, hadn't have the guts to defy the censorship. Well, yeah, exactly. And then you've got uh, you know the the studio gang and Craig Russell, What's you that? know, certain people in 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 the industry that were all about the art, and they weren't about it was not house style. They they invent you know rights and they invested mm -hmm. so much time into these beautiful pages and that opened the door for my generation big time for us to like actually like not have to draw batman the way everybody draws batman and to be able to bring you know painted comics in uh and you know someone who doesn't get credit for that who really should is howard shaken yeah that's what i was, was going to say because you have the studio guys in one side and then you have the other crazy studio where starling shaking Right. Uh, in, in sometime, you know, Frank Miller and the others, and Walter Simonson, of course, went yes. just crazy changing the language. That's right. And you have the studio guys changing the language in the art side again. So, you know, I think it was more, more or less at the same time, right? Yeah, and it all came together, you know. Yeah. That opened the door for for my generation big time, and I and it's and it's interesting because there are people who get credit for the painted comic thing, and it's like, and I, I forget what what it was on Facebook or something, and. And I chimed in about Chaikin. I'm like, well, you know, Flowers of Heaven, Roses of Hell, and blah, blah. And I'm like, these were they, way before that, you know, and totally blew my mind at, when I was in high school, you know, like, huh, you know, the, the possibilities then just, you know, and you saw a lot of that in European comics, you know, uh, in heavy metal, in Metal Herlant and all that, where that, you know, it took a while for America to kind of get on board. And, yeah, you know. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. At the same time, people tell you, well, there was that stuff in Europe. And I always answer, yeah, but it was in America. For, with the exception of some translations in heavy metal of Metal Ulan, yeah. the rest you didn't see. It was yeah. not. Okay. I don't think it was because of the European stuff that Howard and the others, you know, did it. It was just a time when they started and said, I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. Well, and it's like, well, and you know, you, I, I think too that there was a there was cross pollination going on uh, through people that went to European festivals yeah. back in the '70s. You know, like Jeff and the gang when they were touring, and they so there, you know, then then you're being exposed to like, how come you know, how come we just now got Paramus, you know, and. To, I mean, I know they tried in the little magazine format at one point, but it's crazy that we're just now getting this. And, you know, in Palacios, forget it. There's there's nothing in English. Yes. It drives me insane, you know. But I've, so I've got this massive you know, European library that I can't read, <laughs> but, but the art is, like, stunning, you know. And, and I, you know, and so in my classes, I'm constantly bringing this stuff out. I go, you know, this is what you guys are missing, you know. And you're over here drawing manga. Look at this stuff, you know. Like, come on, like, step up, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, nothing against manga, but it's like shoot for the moon here, you know. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's never bad about manga, but it's always bad when you only have one influence instead of. You gotta have more than one sandbox. You gotta like, you gotta get out, get, start throwing the sand out of the box, you know. Come on. Okay. No, that's why I used to do. Not in your case, but with many. American creators, I used to tour them through the con, you know, for not anymore because it's easier to get, but like 10, 15 years ago, it's like, okay, this is Mandrafina, this is Jose Munoz, this is, I remember when people in America didn't know Alberto Breccia. Yeah. And I was like, or oh, Burnett, You're yeah. gonna you gotta watch this. And it's like, oh, I know this. I didn't know it was this guy. And then, you know, they start, yeah. they start with Mort Cinder and it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Now yeah. I understand, you know, Sin City in a way where, you know, and they, they start to understand, oh, Frank Miller has a lot of influence. He's studied comics. Yes, he has. Like, he's not just the guy who's crazy and does this stuff and does these comics. No, Frank Miller is a scholar of comics. The guy has studied a lot of manga, studied a lot of European Argentinian comics, and that's where the, the milk of influences 
is in his work in Sin City. You don't do, you know, that rain and that scene without having watched Breccia before, for example, and things like that. Yeah, and there's and there's an aspect too. Like if you look, I mean, again, I'm I'm painting with a wide brush, but you know, the, the people that I admire, and some of them are, you know, my 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 confederates, my compadres, you know, that we all started at the same time. But the thing is, is that I know where they're coming from and it's not just comics. Yeah. They're, they're looking way outside. They know <laughs> illustration. They know all the great pen and ink artists. They, you know, and that, and it's something I try to get my students to invest in. I'm like, look, this is the, 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 what's the right order? The lingua franca, you know, this is the, this is the language that we speak. Yes. And, that professionals speak and if you don't know this language this history you're you're cut out of this absolutely you can't communicate in a in an intelligent way that will you know because when we talk like i go you know i teach every summer with the illustration academy mm -hmm. and this is like uh you know well mark mark has passed away but mark english gary kelly cf Payne, sterling hunley you know go through the list of these amazing illustrators and who were movers and shakers, you know, Brad Holland. I mean, and when we sit around and talk, it's like, it's artists. Oh man, what about this? What about, and it's all this, and it's not current, it's old stuff. Yeah, yeah, so you know, Mark Chuelo entered the chat on YouTube and he's yelling, and, oh, Jorge, cool. Zafi, and Jorge Zafino. <laughs> oh, cool, yeah, man. Let, see, amazing, see it again. You can look at the, the work of, 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 of either of those and know, and I, Mark and I went to school together, and I, so, yeah, I mean, it is, it's like, there's this, it's not a bubble. It's this massive, you know, Mark introduced me to the Edward Tooney work, mm -hmm. you know, the, the German uh, uh, artist in Simplicissimus, which opened up a whole other world for me, you know, but yeah. And it's like, that's the stuff that people need to be looking at. It's like comics can, can, and has been so, um, What's the word I'm looking for? You know, uh, constrained. Well, you know, where it's self-referential. Absolutely, absolutely. To the, to the point of just killing itself, yep. uh, of stunting its own growth. And and the thing that's gonna that has changed it and will always change it is people that have a larger world that they're bringing something from outside into comics. That's that's different, and that is personal. You know, and that that's how you change things. That's how I'm you grow the medium but it's also it's let me stress this harshly because i keep telling this to artists and illustration and most of the times they don't listen stop watching the same stuff go back go to the origin draw a line i mean you cannot get to john Buscema without alex raymond yeah you cannot get to john jose Luis garcia lopez without alex raymond you cannot get etc 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 like the line i think terrell and i were talking to, and we do draw a line you know you have to you have to have Michael Golden to have Arthur Adams. You have to have you know Arthur Adams to have Jim Lee. You have to have, and those are all guys that you say they're personal. But why are they personal? Because they drew from a lot of different influences. Yeah, instead of they're, they're, instead of constantly dipping into the same well, you know, go back. Like if you're into someone, dig. Who were they looking at? And then who was that person looking? And and start plumbing the depths. You know, like digging through and see again like you know like mark and i when we were in school we didn't get a history of illustration mm -hmm. i'm assuming uh, jorge as well you know like we didn't get a history of this stuff we had to find it and it was and that the, the the actual act of discovery was what was what mattered you know the digging and the you, you know the hunt was yeah. really important yeah and you know and as far as you know like i'm working on a book right now with Casra of my collecting all my short sequential work, which we're hoping to get out as a Kickstarter several months from now, maybe, you know, but like, and in that, in my intro, I mentioned like, you know, I mean, man, I, I eat, sleep, crap comics. I love it, you know, but I never wanted to have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I consider myself an, a, a real outlier because I don't do it every day. Like, like the people in the trenches do. And that's why I have so much respect for every single, you know, everybody that does comics because it's such hard work. You know, I think it's the hardest art thing to do 
is this marriage of words and pictures and being able to, to make that work. And so I'm like an outsider and, you know, and I'm, and I'm so thankful I've been able to get to do as much as I've done, but you know, I have so many other outside interests, but it's like, when I look at comics, it's like, I don't know if people truly understand how hard that stuff is to do. You know, it's an, it's an ungodly amount of work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and people, you know, it's like, what's his name? Um, Oh, I can't believe I can't think of his name. Uh, what's the, you know, the Gollum uh, baseball. He teaches at the Center for Cartoon Studies. And I can't believe I can think of his name. But anyway, he did a strip that was so Mark, awesome. Mark, help us, please. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Uh, and it's uh, it shows him working on his graphic novel. And you see the pages of the 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 calendar flying away and the and the and the the seasons coming and going and he's just laboring and laboring and laboring and then he and he finally gets the book and he goes hey man check out this graphic novel I did you know and the guy goes in twenty minutes he goes oh that's really cool and he walks he walks off and you're just like oh my god you know people burn through these things and it's like it's an it's an ungodly amount of work, you know, that they invested themselves in this stuff, you know. Every every comic artist does, and it's like, hats off, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Uh, Elber Galaga says, "Hello, hola, for George. What's the process of creating a piece of art for a ma Magic the Gathering card? Did, did you get pointers on uh, what to draw?" The card text or something like that. They they would send. Uh, man, it's been years since I've done one of those. But uh, we received a little little. Uh, not not they didn't explain it, but they sort of told you what it was about, and then you could like then you turned in sketches. Mm -hmm. um, but it explained, you know, I mean, I wish I remember, but it didn't like specify what was going on, just like what what it was about, and then you could kind of go off on it. I don't know if that's how they do it now or not. Uh, one of my one of my ex students was, I don't think he's there anymore. But Jeremy Jarvis was one of my ex students from when I taught at Pratt Institute, and uh, he got way up on the totem pole of that stuff. Um, but yeah, they I don't know if that's how they handle it now. I have no idea. Cherello uh, says is Ben Catcher. The artist you meant. Cherello says the name is no, Ben Catcher. No, it's, uh, let me look it up in uh, real quick. Let me see. Okay, don't worry about it. And uh, Elber Galarga also asked, also, is that Arnold Schwarzenegger in the painting in the back? No. This one? I guess so, yeah. No, here, I'll pull it down off the wall and see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a World War One painting that I did of a doughboy. Holy crap. Get that out of the way. There. And it's, uh, yeah, it was, again, see, I can't shake this World War One stuff. Uh -huh. uh, I've, I've got all kinds of paintings that, you know, I've been working on over the years. Don't break it. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that nail looks like it's bent. I'm going to set it on the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you have more time, <laughs> you put it back. <laughs> Save yeah. it. The nail is like this. I, yeah. Okay, uh, so it's not Ben Catcher, Mark. Just so you know. Yeah, it's um, man, I'm gonna look it up real fast. Yeah. Uh, let's see. While you watch, uh, Philippe Brel says my daughter did her thesis on Mexico comics. Her tutor picked picked it, not me, but they were some incredible work. I've never seen, have never seen any com Mexican comics before. Um, um, only in like histories of comics mm -hmm. have I seen those. Um, let me see if they have a thing here. So alumni programs, surely they tell us who the. Uh, all right, let me see. Me, no. Uh, let me go down here. Um, and, and I can't believe I can't think of his name because he came, he even came here and hung out. Mm -hmm. um, 
about. Let's see, overview. Let's see. Board of Trustees, contact us. Uh, all right, so let me just type in. Yeah. I can't believe I don't have a thing about teachers. Don't worry, I keep I keep uh, answering people. Uh, no. uh, Angel is asking if uh, whatever Netsuka has been published in Spain. No, I don't think it has. Uh, the DC stuff. Yes, yeah. but the mobile stuff hasn't been published here in Spain, I think. So you either ask Panini to do it or, you know, get the American edition. It should be available. Uh, Elbert says, Amazing Earth has from Sharon George. Um, what else? Yeah, Chris Note. Has, uh, Gollum's Mighty Swing, James Sturm. Okay. <laughs> Now we know. <laughs> Stop thinking about it. Um, you, yeah, said, me too, though. <laughs> you said before success. You gotta say success. What well, um, you said before, you know, comics was before because you know you were ill. You stop. You 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 had you, had, you started watching the, the you know the TV show, and then of course that gets you to people to your your parents bringing you comics, and then you start to read them. Then so would you were hooked to them for life, but. Um, why art is your way of expressing yourself? I mean, or, or why this art? Why illustration? Why not movies? Why uh, not music? Why not? Well, I do all those things actually. I, you know, when I was young, my friend, uh, my friend Lum Edwards and I, he was into comics too, and uh, so we did our. We had a fanzine. I thought maybe I might have some of those lying around. Uh, we did a fanzine back then that we would go every first Sunday of every month to his dad's office it was a uh, insurance salesman. And we would like write up our stories and we already had all the art drawn and we would like put our dummies together, you know, and type up everything. And then we would Xerox them and fold them and staple them and, and send them out. And we had ads in the buyer's guide and all that stuff. But we also uh, made movies. Um, my dad had a super eight camera and we filmed, tons of these little short films and I was totally hooked into, you know, and that into movies and, and, you know, and editing them and, you know, actually cutting the film and, and, you know, special effects wise, we had to draw laser beams on the, on the super eight film, you know, and animate it. But, um, and when I went to, I went to the first, my first year of college, I went to university mm -hmm. and didn't do any art at all. Um, and I joined the frat and I didn't, you know, I had a girlfriend the whole bit. And my dad came and he said, look, you know, they had visited New York. Uh, he went to, a, it might've just been a, a vacation, but he goes, to, he would go to these, uh, he was a physician and he would go to these, you know, uh, convention things. But they visited Pratt Institute and he said, look, you know, I, you know, I really want to, I will help you if you want to go to art school. I'll help you do that. And he goes, or if you want to go to film school, like go to Southern Cal and study film, he goes, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. Or you can do what you're doing now. He goes, but here it is, you know, and, and man, I thought long and hard, and, you know, Star Wars had come out and my dad was like really into Star Wars and close encounters, you know? And so he, the film was just like, he really want, I think he really wanted me to go into film. Yeah. And, well, that was Jaws. Yours, Star Wars, uh, Close Encounters, and those five, six years, Alien. Alien, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and so, man, it was – but I, I have to say I didn't struggle that hard. I, you know, uh, I went to art school. And um, – but I've – you know, I have made – I did the documentary film a few years – well, several years ago now. Uh, and that went over really well. We spent five years on this film, um, and we – did the conventions, the festival circuit, mm -hmm. but we, we premiered it in the New York International Independent Film Festival and won Best Feature Documentary that year. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we did Santa Barbara and we did Hot Springs and all that. And we started another documentary uh, I did with the same director who was a big comic book fan. And that's how it happened was he wanted to do a documentary on Enemy Ace. And I was just like, 
I'm so burned out on this. You know? <laughs> Leave he me alone with an MEA, you all. <laughs> he, liked, he liked the historical aspect. And I said, well, I'm doing this blues book and it's historical and you can get it from day one, you know? And so, and I'd already made my trip through the Mississippi Delta to research all this stuff and interview these, all these old blues guys. And so we re, we retraced my journey and went and filmed all these guys. But so, but then he said, I want to make another movie. What do you want to, you know, what do you want to do? And I was like, yeah, me too. And I'm like, let's, I want to do a film on Harvey Dunn mm -hmm. and uh, in his first world war uh, experience. And so we started that. And that was when I was still living in New York and we got a lot in the can. I mean, we, we, and we were shooting 16 millimeter as well as high def digital, you know, uh, and we went to the Smithsonian and they took us into the bowels and pulled everything out for us. Wow. Even the holes, I got to hold the box that he took in the trenches and wow. And then they, and then we went to Walt Reed at illustration house and did a big shoot and the uh, Kelly collection, Richard Kelly, sent over three huge oils for us to put in behind Walt. And then Walt was friends with the Dunn family. So they overnighted sketchbooks that Dunn had taken to the trenches. And so we got to film those, you know, go through those. So we have all this material. And then, and then I moved and then Steve went through and then I moved and got married. And, you know, Steve went, got, got, went through some horrible stuff with work. And then he went through a, a killer divorce and we just sort of like we were always in touch but nothing got done you know mm -hmm. and um and then he called me like about a year ago two years about two and a half years ago and he was like everything is sort of quiet he goes i really want to i really want us to finish this film and i said yeah me too you know and so we were casting about because we needed money it was going to take like one hundred fifty thousand dollars to finish this thing which neither of us had you know had and um and so, but we had agreed we were going to do it. And so we started like ramping up and I, we were, we were sending emails out trying to drum up, you know, people to get interested in the project, to front the money. And, and then Steve died. Oh, and, and so the family, the children <clears throat> have the material and they're really cool. I'm, I, you know, I knew them when they were like little, little. And so they're like really cool. They said, if you, you know, when you, when you're ready and you want to finish this, it's yours to finish. And I'm like, that's, that's great. You know? Um, and so I would like to do that and I would love to make a film, a movie movie though, you know, mm -hmm. that's not a documentary. That's a story, you know? Uh, so I don't know. Maybe someday. Yeah. Is there, is there, uh, I mean, we, we, oh, I'm hearing my phone. That's weird. Anyway, I was saying when you start a project, it starts as a certain thing. I mean, it, you know, it's going to be, an illustration or you know this needs to be a documentary or this needs to be a movie or this needs to be a comic or it can just evolve during the process or it can be all of them at the same time i, I was talking to dave mckean three weeks ago about that right and he was like sometimes it is sometimes it just evolves sometimes since i do everything since i do music since i do movies since i do theater since i do it can become everything you know uh, and sometimes you know, and sometimes you don't. So how is it for you? Well, I mean, there are certain things like the, the blues book, you know, did become a little of everything, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it was written, you know, uh, I'd gone through a, a big, and Mark knows all this, <laughs> I'd gone through a big breakup with this girl. And so I had the blues, you know, and, uh, and it became, I sort of stopped doing a lot of art. Mm -hmm. I was just writing, you know, and I was making pictures with words and it was incredibly satisfying, you know, and, and it went on for a pretty good while. And like my buddies were like, man, dude, you need, you need to be doing some painting and drawing. I'm like, yeah, I just don't feel it, you know? And, uh, but it also encompassed my love of that music and, and then, and then being hit up to, and, and, you know, during my trip, I, uh, that was, that was the point where, um, too. So, photography and I come from a long line of photographers. My great grandfather was a professional photographer, portrait photographer. And my granddad was a filmmaker. Uh, that not, wasn't his occupation, but he, we have reels and reels from like early 1900s mm -hmm. up, you know, and, 
of the old, my, my granddad worked for Gulf Oil as a lineman kind of guy. Like, uh, he would go and purchase land for Gulf. So he filmed all these excavations and things um, where they're digging up dinosaur bones, looking for oil and stuff. But so photography has always been there, but it was always this uh, utilitarian device for me to create reference, mm -hmm. you know, for, for comics and art. And when I went down to the, to the Mississippi Delta, that was the first time it became when I, when I connected it with an art form and I, not that I didn't think of it that way anyway, but not for myself. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but man, I mean, all the great, uh, photo journalists, they're, they're huge on my list. And then, you know, all those time life photographers and Magnum and, you know, uh, yeah. Bresson, you know, uh, uh, Bresai, everything. But so that was yeah, like, we got all the others, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's again, it's an endless list, but, Absolutely. Um, Salgado, I mean, you know, but when I'm looking at these old blues men and I'm, and I was there and everything was available light and whatever, and I'm shooting 35 this is what way before digital cameras. And I got then then I saw the possibilities and began to shoot for, for art's sake. Mm -hmm. And then the other leap for me for that was going through my divorce and trying and having to take these trips up to North Carolina from Florida to be with my children. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to hang on to every single second with my children. So it became, I was, you know, cataloging and, and trying to invest in that uh, visually. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go out firefly hunting and all that. And so photography took on an entirely new world for me where it was it was an art form and it was an uh, it was an expression so in a way that the, the uh, let me start to, inter to interject here so the, the writing and the photography you know in a big way was something cathartic that you just needed to explode with yeah i mean i was always writing as a kid i i'm a huge i'm a massive reader i read constantly you know and everything i mean i, I my I'm very diverse you know same with my music. I, it's, it's incredibly eclectic, you know. Um, I just love all of it, you know. And, um, yeah, so, but, yeah, that story, literally, the blues thing, like, it it would not be denied, you know. <laughs> it's just, you know. And, uh, and it's, it's hefty. It's like 300-page, you know, typewritten page, you know. But, um, or more, I don't know. But, like, uh, and the same with the... Thing I was saying earlier about the First World War, yes, writing on it for years now, and I've got just this massive amount of material that I've written, and uh, and the struggle has been how am I going to organize all this? <laughs> you know, how do you organize all this? And the more I thought about it, I see again, this is the beauty of, or, or maybe the curse, but of it taking so long and being able to step back and see, you know, the, the thread and. And when they're thinking about it, like, how do I string this, all these disparate things I've written together of this guy's journey? And the more I thought about it, I said, well, wait a minute, you know, like, our lives are linear only in the sense that we look back through it. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? But going forward, I mean, yeah, sometimes we make certain choices and we know what's going to happen. But a lot of it is yeah. just up in the air. And so I, yeah, I said, okay, I'm not even going to organize it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to just put it all together. Uh, and it becomes its thing, and and it's only when you look back through it how that you feel the connections. You know, okay. so that was like that was that was a load off, right? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> got that aspect, but but again, you know, hindsight and all that, and and it all comes together. You know, yeah, just, just and, take <laughs> and, and that's funny because that's also something that I keep telling about us comic readers that we experience time different than the rest of the world. And people tell me, well, why? Because from the beginning, first thing we know is to learn between the lines. I mean, read between the lines, which is read between the gutters. We know how interpreted alliterations from the get-go. Yeah. So always when we read, we read a book, we read the news, we watch the news, whatever, we are automatically uh, trained to not take things literally. Yeah. To read between the lines, to look from what's behind. And the second thing I say, this is the why that's why it's the most complex and difficult art.
because not only we read between the lines, comics is the only thing that can. Chiarello is going to think I'm fucking nuts for saying this, <laughs> but I always repeat, comics is the only thing that defies Einstein's relativity theory, 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 because we can manipulate time in any way, shape, or form. We what we can, and he's the only art who can do it. Well, you don't think film does that? No. Really. Thing has, to, thing, thing has to go from uh, first, with exceptions, of course. Uh, first arc, second arc, you know, beginning, middle, and end. But with comics, I can take you, and I have to go to Watchmen, as an example. I can take you from in issue one and show you a character in the back, in, in panel three of the page, and then on issue five, I show you that character, and I'm telling you, it's happening at the same time, although we have five issues, and I just manipulated time in a way you could never, you could never get, and all the layering is there and there and there, so it's constantly the art form is a manipulation of time, believe it, whether you like it or not, because just the shape of the panel determines the timing. So that, of course, of course yeah. movies do it in a way, but I think it's so embedded in comics as an art form that whatever you do from the first second and panel to the last. It's a manipulation of time that I don't think any other art does it. Yeah, it's interesting because there, <coughs> there are some that say, you know, comics are movies on paper. And no, no. Yeah, no, they're not. And it's, uh, and you know, what's interesting too to watch movies, and, and you saw Lucas playing with it, in, especially in American Graffiti. Yep. The split screen stuff, struggling to break that format and to show multiple things going on. And to change that that thing they're stuck that's, with. That's Lucas. Let me say it this way. And I know he's a huge fan and a huge collector. That's Lucas trying to use the comics language in a movie. Absolutely. It's not the other way around. And the right. people who tries to do uh, movies with comics, they don't do good, good comics. They do shit. Yeah. <laughs> so we try to get a language that is not ours. Yeah. And shape us as we are well, not. You know, the best comics are always the time who are just pure use of our language. And then others try to copy it, you know, and we've seen a lot of movies trying to emulate the comics language. Yeah. And with few exceptions, it never works. Yeah. Because with with movies, you know, of course you have elapses, you have jumps, you have, you know, black screens to tell you this thing has ended. You have Kubrick making, being a genius with the, again, with the language and the timing in 2001, just to give an example. Yeah. But with comics, it's just natural. You don't have to force it. Yeah. If you want to do a comic, you gotta play with time. You gotta play with the situation and with your spaces. The other languages, as, as I said, with movies, you go from point A to point B to point C to point D because it's part of the language to tell you a continuous story. You cannot change the location. You can, but even see what I mean. If you're doing a movie and you're going to jump in time and place, there's a, there's something that says, you know, like in the James Bond movies. We are now in Rio, or we are now in Venice, or it, three weeks later. Yeah. I can take a comic, not telling you anything about that, just change the coloring from one panel to the next. And I already told you, time is different, place is different. But there are things we borrow heavily from, from film. Yep. In comics, you know, and it's just part of the language, which is establishing shots, close ups, extreme close ups, and, you know, and then the splitting of panels. One image, chopping it up, but that's a nice, you know, pan or dolly shot, and you can, you know, so we do bring certain aspects of it over big time. But the fact that we can change the structure of a of a scene, you know, the actual graphic of it is huge, yep. you know, um, big time. And comics had dolly shots because before dolly dolly cameras existed. Yeah. Dolly, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, it's interesting too is that, like you mentioned, like the comic readers have this, this you know, innate sense now of have you know having read comics, and it's really interesting because I, it, it, like my sister, mm -hmm. grew up you know around me reading comic books, and we would visit my cousins, and and my cousin Marianne read you know Richie all the Harvey comics, Richie Rich, and all that, and 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 uh, Archie. And so we all read that stuff, and it was really interesting when uh, when my enemy Ace came out. <clears throat> I remember giving a copy to my sister, and she sat down to read it, and she was like, 
she said, um, I don't know if I'm reading this right. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, do I go from here, here? And do I go over, you know, and I'm like, and it just, you know, I take it for granted that people wouldn't know how to read this. And she was lost, you know, and I said, no, it's like pages, unless there's a very definite break on a page, you're, you know, you go yeah, right, you know, and she's like, oh, and then she got into it. But it was like, that blew my mind, you know, like, wow, I just thought everyone knew how to read a comic book. You know? No, they don't. And there's people, I don't, sh sorry, I don't remember who it was, but in one of this, we were discussing this. I think it was Adam and Hughes. He told me that one member of, of his family literally cannot read the comics. Adam Hughes? Yeah, I think it was Adam Hughes. I think it was Adam Hughes who told yeah. me that Adam one Hughes. member of his family uh, literally, she can't. See, even if you try, she can't. They, she doesn't understand. He can't even. You can explain it in a million ways, but she can't. Like that, and he was like, that made me realize not everybody can can read comics. Yeah, I, we assume that they do, but they can't because again, you need to be able to read between the lines, between the gutters, the, the alliteration. You need to make that jump of, you know, Superman does this, and the next panel he's already flying. Yeah. And we take it for granted because we've always done it. Yeah. But in a way, you can understand that people's like, oh, what happened there? Well, and it's like I also, you know, I, I also take for granted that people know, you know, the Batman story and the, the Superman story. And it's funny because my friend uh, Floyd Hughes uh, from London, uh, but from Ghana, and he married a Guyanese uh, woman, and they went to see that first Batman film when it came out. And he was, he was telling me the story. He was like, they were sitting there and they're watching it. And she like, she, she hits him and he's like, what? She goes, I think Bruce Wayne is Batman. And he was like, what? <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like, but she figured it out, you know, and she was so proud. And he was like, I thought everybody knew that, <laughs> you know, but we, but we take it for granted that everybody knows these stories and they don't, you know, but that's like watching your, your kids. Like in my case, or uh, Erin, as you met her, you know, when she was four, or six-year-old, and suddenly she's discovering everything. And she's making her, her mind and like, oh, I think that's the bad guy. Of course, you know she's, she's the bad guy. Yeah. But it's like watching, oh, I think she's the, the bad guy. No. And I always go, and why do you know? Like, oh, because of this and that. And you see how they put all the strings together. And you're like, wow. They think, uh, they, I think we take for granted yeah. discovery. Or, you know, like, the other day, I think she was doing Lego, Lego you know, the Lego cartoon with uh, with the Avengers, and suddenly she goes like, "Tony Stark is Iron Man." <laughs> and we are like, "What?" Yeah, Tony Stark is Iron Man. Like, how do you know? It's like, the armors are there. That's his house. Yeah. And it, it wasn't him pulling. That was like three seconds before, you know, the the, the armor plate open. Yeah. Like. You, you watch it before, like, no, 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 it's, he's in his house, he's landing, he's Iron Man. Yeah. And that's what I just said, you know, we take it for granted, but the moment you see how they put all the pieces together, it's so amazing. Another fun thing was my, my cousin, uh, she's all, she's grown up now, but when she, when that first Batman movie came out, she was, you know, just a little kid. And I remember we watched it and she was like totally into it. And I said, okay, now I want to show you another another Batman movie. She's like, oh, and I put in, I put in the Adam West film, and we watched, <laughs> she loved it. And I said, so what's your so which one is your favorite Batman? And she's like, she looked at me and she was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, she goes, it's Batman. <laughs> and I was like, yes, it's so cool, amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, uh, let me see what people says. We're not ignoring you guys, but just having fun. Uh, Chris Noth, one more question for George. Who do you think is the best? The best. Oh, an easy one. Get ready for this. Who do you think is the best comic artist working today? And why do you think he or she? You say he, Chris. Let me ask. He or she? Why do you think he or she is the best? I can't even go there. This and this <laughs> like this, that's a Mark Chirello question. And <laughs> I can't do it. It's like. There's a lot of them, you know. Uh, 
Mark, if you want to get online, I can send you the link. And <laughs> so, so you jump in and say, Dave, with the best. That is a total Mark Mark Torello question. And, and he knows. It's like it, I'm constantly, I'm like, oh, my God, I just can't do this. You know? uh, I can't. I mean, I, yeah. I, there's so much I love. And I'm and, and honestly, I'm like sort of not connected right these days, you know. I'm, I'm sort of, in a lot of ways, sort of disgusted with a lot. I mean, I, I'll, I'll buy anything Mignola does. Yeah, of course. You know, uh, Tim Sale, you know, uh, Jorge, I would buy anything. <laughs> I would get anything Jorge does. Um, um, uh, Darwin Cook, I was I was such a fan. Yeah. And he lived down the road here in Tampa, you know. <clears throat> um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's that's just I can't do that. Mm hmm. Because they're all so different, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's also a big part of uh, what comics is, you know, like Mark loving Ruben Pellejero at the same time he loves Adam or Tim Sale or, yeah. or, or you know, we're talking about Palacios or, uh, or, yeah. or Jose Muñoz or any of the other classic Spanish ones, you know, like Jesus Blasco or any of the others. Uh, that's they, all, what, they all bring something different to the table and that's why I love every one of them. You know, it's like they're not the same and it's, and I can't, I can't pick things like that, you know. Um, yeah, I, I can't even go there, you know. Yeah, when I when I ask about that, like in movies or in comics, I always say the same thing. Okay, I'm going to give you one answer. Why? This is the answer I just thought about and it's today. Ask me again tomorrow and I will say another one. Give me another one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's your family movie? Today? Okay, today's bullet. And we've been through, Mark and I have done through, you know, been through the, uh, with Scott Hampton and, and uh, the gang, it's like, if you Desert Island, what's the one comic series you would take if you could only have one comic series? And uh, it was either EC or or Creepy and Eerie, <laughs> you know, for me anyway, because then it's like you have all these incredible artists and you have all these stories, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, but again, you know, see that just is a killer question because that means I got to give up, you know. All the yeah. Labs, Batman and all my Swamp Thing and all you know, all my Sergeant Rock and you know, I mean, like it's just that's murder, you know. Yes, absolutely. Ooh, um, punishment. Uh, let me see. Uh, I have a question. Chris says, "What is George's retirement plan? Is stop working or continue exactly like before, or something completely different to what uh, you view Solidas do, but you didn't have to do." You didn't have time to do before. <laughs> They're trying to kill you, man. <laughs> I mean, I've been I've been real fortunate in that. Um, well, part of it is like I don't know if you've ever read the John D. McDonald books, mm -hmm. uh, Travis McGee. Yeah, and, you know, and what in the whole Travis's whole thing is he's taking his retirement a little bit at a time, all the time, you know, and that's sort of yeah. And it's like um, I've been real fortunate in in being able to teach because. It's afforded me the the financial stability to do whatever I want outside of the teaching, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I'm painting, I'm I've been able and through comics, I've been able to travel, you know, thanks to, to festivals and stuff, which is just a joy, you know. And um, yeah, so yeah, it's just more of the same, you know, just painting and drawing and uh, playing guitar and reading and. Uh, more travel would be cool, you know, and landscape painting, you know. But, that, yeah. that takes me to the ne to, uh, to the next one. Um, what do you like to do in your free time? Drawing yeah. and painting, and <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. That's the thing. It's like, and it's it's <laughs> difficult for you know, and, and and it's funny because it goes to this thing that happened to John Van Fleet. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, uh, well, one, people, they, because we do enjoy what we do, people sort of attach a, uh, you know, uh, uh, that it's less than work, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that John had this thing happen where he went to the dentist and the guy said, oh, you know, he's getting ready to work on his teeth. He goes, oh, he goes, you, you draw comics and stuff. And John's like, yeah. And he goes, what, what have you done? He goes, oh, I've done, you know, this, that, the other thing, whatever. And he goes, oh, man. He goes, can, can you do my son like a, a Wolverine drawing? And John's like, yeah, are you going to, like, fix my teeth for free? Yes. And the guy got really mad at him. And John's like, 
I spent the same amount of money to go to art school that you went, that you paid to go to dental school. Yeah. And that this is my job, you know? And that's like the plumber. I always say the same, it's the same example. People is like, oh, but the plumber, you know, he cost me a lot of money to fix that thing and he did it in five minutes. No, he didn't do it in five minutes. He's been studying for 20 fucking years to do it. And that's how, that's why he can do it in five minutes. Yep. That's, that's the same with the sketch. A guy, oh, that sketch was fast. How are you going to charge me whatever money? Like, you know how much time has been has he been drawing to get to the point where he can do that sketch in five minutes? Yeah, but see, but you love what you do. You should do it for free. <laughs> you know, but that's the that's the the thing that came out of the Whistler trial, you know, with Ruskin was you're gonna like charge this person this much money for this painting that took you uh, a, a couple hours to dash off. He goes, No, I'm charging you for a lifetime of knowledge and work that it took to get to this place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like that's like Picasso when he was asked about inspiration, and he always said, "I don't wait for inspiration. I I I want inspiration to find me working." Well, that was uh, Chuck Close. You know, inspiration is for amateurs. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's also true. Uh, let me see. Um, Carolina Benster asks, "What about digital techniques? Have you tried digital painting, iPad?" Yeah. Um, if I get my iPad, I can show you a couple. Let me grab it. Oh, I, don't, I don't do it for real. You know what I mean? For like jobs. But let me grab my iPad. Okay. You just saw me opening the window. So these are... Uh, Oh, wait, oh, I'm in the wrong thing here. Hang on. Uh, let me go back. Let me go out of here. Done. Um, but I, I really love Procreate on the iPad. So I don't know how these show up, but they're going to be blown out. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it, looks, it looks good, believe me. Wow. That's, that looks white to me. I don't know what it looks like to you. That's There's lots going on in here. Yeah, it looks white. That's true. So if you go, uh, you can share your screen, right? Yes. So, or actually, can I share my screen? Yes, you can. It's so in I, the, uh, yes, in the in the at least I see it in the lower bottom left. There's like a screen that says share your, share your screen. Share your screen. All right, let me go. Let me let me call it up first. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Stop. Okay, let's see, organize, digital. Mm, I've got it in here, somewhere. Um, there it is, all right. Let me make it bigger. Okay, and then I can click on these and show y'all, but let me come back to here, share screen. Mm -hmm. Select window or screen. Entire screen. How about that? Uh, Lux, you know who, who just entered the, uh, the, the chat? Huh? Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. And uh, the master awesome. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. And he says, inspirations are for amateurs. That's a good one. <laughs> He's one of my heroes. Yes. And one of the nicest people on the planet. That's so true. So here's uh, we're, we're, we're seeing the screen, yes. Oh, is that there it is? So this is on this is digital, uh, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna scroll through because here this is uh, here this is like a, a video, <laughs> music and everything. That's nice. <laughs> Sketchbooks. Sometimes with gel pens. I'm using an Apple pencil.
these are like these, you know, what I do in sketchbooks, but, um, so this is, these are all digital. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's my daughter. And that one actually got in, uh, this one's kind of fun. Let me play that one. It's faster. And, and, I make, this, and this is all Procreate? Yeah, and I make my own brushes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I only use really like one or two layers max. Uh, Felipe Abreu tells you, uh, awesome regarding digital, I just have discovered infinite painter for the iPad. It has some amazing pencils which work better than the ones in Procreate. Yeah, I've had, uh, I've had people push me to go there, but it's like, I, I really like Procreate and what it, it just gets out of the way and lets me have fun drawing. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's what I get from most of the people that uses Procreate instead of Clip Studio or Infinite or any other, like, I just have fun with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, I mean, I, that, that, that portrait of my daughter actually got in Spectrum that year. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I, but I just do it for my own pleasure. I'm not doing it for uh, quote unquote real, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, but, I, but it's interesting too, because some of the things that I've, that I play, because I really play with color in, in these things, and um, mm -hmm. Delacroix. Um, this was this, uh, someone wrote me and asked if I, wait, no, it's not this, maybe it is this guy, I don't remember. Um, oops, what's going on? Oh, I see, these are just layers. But um, yeah, for me, it, it, there's things I've been playing with in color here that actually find their way over to, um, my oils, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of fun. Um, but let's see, where are these guys? These are oh, the, exper the experiment. The experimentation with iPad also takes you to use uh, new techniques or new ways or or new tools on the on the on the on the painting on the you know on the physical painting. Yeah, it, and I've been you know and well and then also uh, I've been I've been experimenting a lot too, which not necessarily digitally, but with. Uh, non-traditional drawing and painting implements, you know, mm -hmm. putty knives and rollers and things like that, that have been really, really fun um, in that sense. I can show you too real quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, let me hide that. And I have, this is the book that I'm working on. If you want to see that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, um, a lot of the short comic fiction the comic sequential things that I've done, like through heavy metal and whatnot. Um, so this is the, the cover idea for the book. So it's a wraparound. Mm -hmm. And this is for the, the case. And uh, this would be another part of another one of the hardcover deals. And then um, let's see. And this is the one you. This is the one you are not finding a publisher for. Well, we. I actually didn't shop this around. We're going to do it through Kickstarter. Um, but let I, me. I could be, I could be absolutely surprised if nobody, no one in Europe wanted to publish this. But don't know, okay. So here's you know so and Bill Sienkiewicz is going to write the introduction, which is really cool. Nice. Um, let's see. Oh, don't lock up on me. Yeah, so my introduction, you know, mm -hmm. there we are doing our fanzine back in the <laughs> <laughs> school, you know. Uh, and there's that's out painting with that's Dan Green, Jeff Jones, and Bernie Wrightson. We were out landscape painting. Jay Move, mm -hmm. uh, but then so in then in the in the uh, and so here's like uh, the letter I wrote to Marie Severin back in 1978. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I was going to, I sent her my portfolio and, uh, it took her a year to get back to me <laughs> <laughs> she did, and she sent me all kinds of cool stuff. And then Kerry Gamble, I met him at a con and this is all high school stuff that I was doing at the time in our fanzine here, which was all, you know, me copying, uh, my heroes, 
right? My art heroes. I, I learned how to draw by, by copying. I didn't trace, uh, but I learned by copying. So these were all high school stuff, you know, trying to, trying to learn how to draw. And um, did a lot of work, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, so then we, you know, you get past, so then you get into art school and this is some of the art school comic work that I was doing. And then I became the king of the unfinished. <laughs> you <know>? uh, <laughs> but really trying to do painted comics, you know? Uh, mm. And then that was 83. Um, this was art school and this is art school. And I actually showed this to Archie Goodwin at Epic and he liked the art, but he said, yeah, you got way too many headshots, you know, <laughs> and it just like stopped me in my tracks. I just like, all right, all right, all right I quit. <laughs> you know? and, don't, uh, don't say a bad word against Archie. You know that, you know that Tierra was going to kill you if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, but hey, that was the thing. It was one of the best advice, uh, pieces of advice I got, you know, it was like, yeah, too many headshots. You gotta, you gotta tell the story, you know. Yeah, move, move, move um, the camera around. Of course, yeah. Yeah, and this was uh, Kent and I used to just hit the cons, and sit, we did a big setup, you know, that we would show our work constantly. And then I was apprenticing with Marshall Rogers, and this was a, a job he gave me to do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, parish rooftops for Madame Xanadu. Uh, and this was when I was apprenticing with Marshall. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna jump ahead here. So some of my first heavy metal work uh, and John Workman was like such a sweetheart. He, he kept saying he was going to give me work and then he couldn't find any, anything. And he said, just do something and I'll print it. I was like, cool. So I just started doing these poems and illustrating them and he printed all of them. Mm -hmm. I think Mike Mignola owns this piece here. Uh, this hasn't been scanned yet. It's a big story, an eight pager that uh, was my senior project in art school, but it published in heavy metal. Uh, let's see, let me jump down to actual stuff that got done. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, here's that one for, for uh, Speaky, it was, not was it Speak A1, uh, the British comic. And that's sort of where my Batman thing came out. And some of the stuff, I'm not sure, like this story here, uh, if I'll be able to get permission from DC to reprint it. But I reformatted it and recolored it and re-lettered it. Um, huh, let me move this over. Mm -hmm. So this, this was published in a Sergeant Rock summer special, uh, years ago. And then this was in Weird War Tales, this story here, written by Paul Jenkins. Mm -hmm. It's not lettered yet. Um, so again, I'm not sure if I'll actually get permission. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is, well, this was uh, heavy metal. Um, it'll load there. And this is unpublished. Civil War story. That's Scott Hampton posing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, this is unpublished. There's like a history of barbed wire. Mm -hmm. uh, this is unpublished. And this is all, all this is unpublished at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Uh, except this is a cover for a fan, uh, some comic book way back, but uh, that's digital actually with traditional elements. Uh, so this is a story I wrote about my dad when he was ill, uh, and, and he died of a he died of a brain tumor. Uh, so that's out of my sketchbook, uh, but it's it's called Hugging Rodan. Um, so it's a kind of a true story. And Entropy, which I'm still, this one's unfinished, but it's, uh, I have to still scan the first one, which was published in Heavy Metal. Mm -hmm. 
Interestingly, it deals with a plague. <laughs> <laughs> plague, plague, what's that? We don't know what that is. <laughs> right? uh, Teddy Christensen owns this painting here. We did wow. a big swap years ago in uh, San Diego. Uh, this was published in uh, a thing called Monocyte. And uh, I had my children, they were little at the time, and I had them do flower drawings. Mm -hmm. That became the actual dialogue in the strip. And it was uh, dedicated to Jeff Jones, who had just mm -hmm. passed away at the time. This was published in Paris or France, you know, and I've reformatted it and recalibrated uh, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the uh, story about Verdun. True, true stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, these were published with uh, first, second books. Um, this is the cover on the right called uh, Above the Dreamless Dead. And it's uh, my adaptation. I did three adaptations of uh, Wilfred Owen poems. Mm -hmm. And they're all done with rollers, paint rollers. Yeah. Um, so again, like that non-traditional stuff, you know, uh, and putty knives, which uh, uh, Daniel Zezel got me on this mm -hmm. plane of rollers, which I'd used in my printmaking, but never occurred to me to use it with acrylics on paper, you know, mm -hmm. turned me on to that when we were working on the uh, African genocide stuff. Uh, and then this African folktale that I'm, I'm actually redoing with the, see this drawn with a putty knife on big 18 by 24 sheets. Mm -hmm. um, whoops. Yeah. So putty knives and rollers. And again, it's they, these are it's not this is not what it looks like. It's going to have panels, you know, it's just yeah. raw, raw art at this point. And these are the layouts from way back, uh, back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. So th that's going to be in the book, which is kind of fun. Um, and I was going to put in. You remember this? Mm -hmm. I'm going to. <laughs> Where is it? Well, the hell. Doc Savage, maybe. Again, if I can get the rights from DC and stuff. It's a Conan cover that. You just, my... you just, you just went past uh, my, my hometown. That's uh, Hercules Tower in La Coruña. Yeah, that was done for the, uh, the the festival there, but they couldn't use it because 1010. So I did a different version for them mm -hmm. that was used. Yeah. Um, and then these are the uh, Valentina things I did for. He, he, he went past the, what you saw the Sandman one was the poster for Heroes Madrid that he did a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, these were done for Fantagraphics. Yes. And then maybe a bunch of the covers, you know, stuff from Marvel and DC and uh, Tops. Mm -hmm. uh, Magic the Gathering comic books, Hercules. Batman, Batman. Again, I don't know if I can use any of this stuff, but mm -hmm. right now it's, uh, you know, shoot for the moon. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so that's where we are so far on this book. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. I could say not bad. <laughs> uh, I could buy it in like three three seconds. Let it me. Takes me to click and, and buy it. <laughs> So how do I turn off sharing the screen? You you did it already. I'm seeing you. Oh, boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, okay, uh, when you start the you start the campaign, let uh, let us know, and uh, I'll pro make the, all the promotion I can. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be. Funded. That would be yeah, I think <laughs> it's sure it's going to be funded. All of you who are watching this, even live. Or, you know, non life, whatever it's called, blah, blah, blah. Later, you gotta, if I know you, I know where you live. If you don't fucking find <laughs> that book on Kickstarter, I have a corner tour right behind me. That's what you see. <laughs> this is my fucking corner tour, okay? I know how to use it. 
I know how to use it. I can get to your house. <laughs> so, find the fucking book. You know you want it. Okay? And this is me doing the campaign already. So, this can be reused at all times. So, when you <laughs> when you do the campaign, you can get 15 seconds and then use it for the campaign. For advertising. Okay, hey. So, on my website, yes. there's the sketchbook. And it's full of my sketchbook stuff, you know. Yes, guys. Get them. And my gallery work. Yes. So paintings and drawings and whatnot. Um, and, and if you're interested, too, I've got, I grabbed a bunch of uh, sketchbooks that I could thumb through if you want to see that. Absolutely. Um, so this I, is. The, I, I believe they want to see them. You guys, <laughs> you want to see that, right? Don't say no. Don't say no. <laughs> well, the, I, I took a sabbatical. Uh, yeah, they are gelling literally, uh, just so you see the reactions, okay, to what you just saw. You you need to see this. Uh, SOS, I am dying. This is so good. Pablo says, this is a master class. I'm loving it. Uh, <laughs> Felipe Gonzalez, excellent art. Jose Maria Guerrero says, what? This is amazing. Paula says, please publish that book. I need that book. Carolina Bensler says, wow, man, wow, of course, of course, we're going to buy it. Don't kill us. We're going to buy it. Uh, the, uh, only thing, the only thing that makes it a master class is Jorge and Mark and Jose in this room. <laughs> so that's really <laughs> cool. <laughs> Man. Well, so I took a sabbatical uh, in 2016 to mm -hmm. Morocco for two months, and uh, I filled up two sketchbooks. Well, and I've been wanting to take that trip since I was uh, for, uh, my first Gosh, year. Gosh, wait, is your iPad connected to the to to the computer still? Yeah, but the, oh, the, I, the, the disconnected. I I mean because the your quality just dropped. I am seeing you really pixelated now. No, the the iPad is off. Ah, oh, weird. Weird. Okay. The, I don't know. You know, it, it dropped quality. You, you were in red and now you're in uh, green and says poor quality and I see you pixelated. Whatever. Right. Whatever. Um, so anyway, so yeah, you know, I saw those uh, John Singer Sargent watercolors mm -hmm. and I was, you know, I want to go to Morocco and I, ne and I just waited way too long and finally did it and was there for two months. Uh, so anyway, I filled up two sketchbooks of stuff uh, and it's just, is it still pixelated? No, that's good. Okay. Um, not, I'll not, not as, not as uh, the, the quality is not as good as we have before, but it's good enough to see it. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, let me jump around. I know. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez is saying to you, you are a true artist. <laughs> yeah, so you know. uh, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So there, uh, there's. And they're all done on the – most of them are done on the spot. These were done on the spot. Um, and, uh, you know, John Foster went with me for the first three weeks. I had to twist his arm, but he had gone through a really horrible breakup with his girlfriend, and he was in a bad place. And I said, dude, you got to go on this thing with me. And he, so, and amazingly, he went. And uh, so, yeah, for the first three weeks, and then the last, you know, the rest of the trip was on my own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I've been trying to talk John into us doing a book of this stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, in writing about it and publishing our photographs and all that, you know. Um, and this is like uh, in in the Atlas Mountains. Um, yeah, a tree in the Atlas Mountains. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let me jump ahead. Watercolor I did in Fez. Of a, one of the whole, you know, the alleys. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm walking in Morocco. <laughs> uh, oh, this girl was, after John left, I was in this Riyadh 
and this girl, 18 year old uh, Japanese girl was traveling alone. And we uh, met her down in the, in the uh, atrium, whatever. And she asked me to draw her. So that was, yeah, I drew her from life. She signed it. Um, this guy sat for me. Mm-hmm. Crayon drawing. Uh, then I met this guy, Idris, and he and his wife had a jewelry shop and carpet store and stuff. And I was buying all this stuff for my mom and my daughter. And, and he said, uh, so what will you do now? You know? And I was like, well, and this is in Fez. And I said, well, I really want to go to the Sahara, which was like back going south again, mm -hmm. 13 hours. And he was like, oh, he goes, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Uh, and, he's, and he got this gleam and he goes, let's do it. And I was like, what? He goes, let's, let's do it. And I was like, he goes, I know a driver. And so, uh, and this is his daughter drawing me and stuff. <laughs> wow. And uh, so we did it, you know, uh, 13 hour car ride with his oldest daughter and myself and him and this driver who couldn't speak English. And we <laughs> ended up staying with these Ganawa musicians uh -huh. in the era. And uh, then we went to, well, and these, this is just different stuff. I mean, just people. Um, and then we went to like a Bedouin camp and had uh, tea in the Sahara, you know. Mm -hmm. I played the Sting song in my head. Um, and, um, and then we went, we got camels and went way into the dunes mm -hmm. and then climbed this, this huge dune. It was, it was backbreaking. Got, got up to the top and they just sat and watched the sunset over the Sahara. It was awesome. Um, going through the market, these were going to die. Uh, uh, I was fascinated by this guy. I kept, I've got some paintings I've started of him. Uh -huh. Pencil, mm -hmm. a lot of writing, you know. <laughs> uh, here's a, here, this is a, some of the photos. I, ha I took a little printer that I could print from my phone. And they have adhesive back, so I was photographing and sticking things in. I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one, and then the other one. I didn't finish this one, but the and the, so then when we got back from the Sahara, <clears throat> um, he said, "Oh, you need to, you, you must come live with us." And so I moved out of the Riyadh, and then, and they gave me their, they gave me their bedroom. And they were sleeping on pallets outside of the, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And they're like, no, you must have your own room with a door so you can be, and I was just like, but it was amazing. And they, and they found out it was my birthday and they hired traditional musicians to come and play so I could draw them. It was amazing. And I got some amazing photographs of these guys that I've started some paintings of. Uh, this is in Jeff Challen, the blue city, mm -hmm. but I didn't have blue. <laughs> More walkers. Mm -hmm. um, crayon drawings in the blue city. Oh, this was waiting for, for the, I had, I had ordered a, called a car service to come pick me up and take me to Tangier, mm -hmm. um, which was the sort of the end of my trip, uh, except I went in the coffee shop and I was using real coffee, you know, in my coffee mugs here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, 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 my last stop in Morocco was Tangier. And then I went to Barcelona, Barcelona mm -hmm. is where I finished. And, th and it was amazing because in Barcelona, uh, when I got there, I went to the, the Egyptian museum, mm -hmm. uh, but I got this email, a, a text message from um, Leonardo. Uh, oh, I can't believe I can't think of his last name. Leonardo Rodriguez. Uh, I, I can't believe I can't think of his last name. I, I apologize. But he's like, are you in Barcelona? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh, my God. And see, I knew him years ago in Venezuela. <laughs> 
I had done some uh, lectures in Venezuela and demos and stuff, and he he's like, oh my god, I, I'm in I'm in Barcelona these days. So he came and uh, he and he goes, I have a show up, and so got together with him and went to the show, and then I and then I got um, another text from a guy that I'm only friends with on Facebook. Uh, great artist and he was like are you, you're in Barcelona I'm like yeah and he's like so he rode a train in from wherever he was and then introduced me to two other artists mm -hmm. went to their studios and then uh, introduced me to the Barcelona Atelier and so I went and did life drawing for a while that was cool and they did a big party of Mai Tais that was awesome <laughs> but uh, yeah it was an unbelievable trip you know it was just mind blowing you know um, and if you follow my uh, Facebook, I've been posting some of the uh, Morocco f photography a little bit once a day. You yeah. Know. Carolina is saying these watercolors must be on the started. What was that? I, I'm sorry. Carolina said those watercolors should be on the Kickstarter book too. Oh, <laughs> well, I hope we do that. Yeah, I, I got to twist John's arm. to. He hates everything he does. And I'm like, no, these are his sketchbooks are awesome. So and he's done. So, well, that's uh, you know, let me grab it. Mm -hmm. This is one of his Morocco paintings. We did the We did the painting. I did a few paintings while I was there. I took my uh, landscape easel and stuff. But uh, we did paintings when we got back from our photos and stuff. But this is one of John's. Awesome. Woo. Yeah, we're, we're swapping. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, you know, so hopefully we'll, we'll do a car, carnet du voyage, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah th those, uh, those, oh, that could be amazing, you know, like a traveling, traveling book by you guys. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just so you know, uh, we've been at this for uh, it's now four minutes to two hours. Yeah. And you have a life. <laughs> so <laughs> let me let me finish this. Uh, well, if you guys have other questions, of course, go and and do them. I, I am if uh, if George is fine continuing and you yeah. guys have more questions, uh, just go with it. But uh, mean uh, while you ask i'm going to go with another one is there any technique for painting or for comics or for you know for art in general that you are that is your favorite like the one you go you always go back to or just depends on the what comes to your mind at any moment of the project or you know the instinct the, your guts in a way yeah it's um well it's weird it's like <clears throat> i think like I look at certain artists and, you know, uh, and they're, and they do one thing, you know, and there's an aspect of, there's a, a part of me that is like sort of envious because it must be nice to be that focused <clears throat> and man, but I, 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 I just bore way too quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, like the graphic novels were, they're a real chore you know, for me, it's like to keep, to do the, and I, and I feel like I owe it to the reader to be consistent with that, obviously, you know, right. I'm, I'm asking you to believe in this world that I'm concocting stylistically. So I feel like I have to carry that all the way through. And so, you know, like enemy ace, the watercolors and, the, and why I broke it up into chapters was so that I could make a little change and not be totally throwing them out of the story. But I bore so quickly, you know, like when I'm doing pen and ink, I wish I was doing watercolor. If I'm doing watercolor, I wish I was painting oils and, you know, and it's like this constant, I wish I was, I you know, so yeah. And it's, you know, certain things definitely uh, suggest an, an approach, mm -hmm. you know, and then other things uh, suggest a different approach. Like I did a cover not too long ago for uh, uh, Michael Guidos and Brian Bendis for uh Pearl and man, I, it's like that thing just about broke me. I, 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 I just didn't know how to approach it, you know? And I, so I started it as uh, a pastel and uh, it felt right. And I kept, the more I did on it, I was just like, no, I'm not feeling it. And then 
oh, let me do, let me do a pen and ink and splatter and whatever. And I did that and I'm like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. And then, and I ended up just defaulting to uh, this kind of thing in my sketchbooks, let's see, where it's uh, a scribble mm -hmm. technique, you know, that I do in my sketchbooks a lot. And, uh, and that felt right. And that's how I finished it, you know. Um, yeah, these these goofy, you know, scribble drawings mm -hmm. that are what I like about them is they're it's non-specific, you know. Uh, it just just scribble, and and it's you just kind of build it, you know. Uh, so that felt right for that, you know. And um, yeah, just <laughs> but uh, man, it's yeah, it's and you know, and it's something I tell the students all the time. It's like yeah, you know. Uh, which they don't want to hear. <laughs> the more you know, the harder it gets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, because they, you know, when you're when you're starting out, you have a limited vocabulary, a limited set of skills, which is great, and and you just work it, you know, and you work it, and you're and you're hitting these plateaus constantly. You're leapfrogging, and it's a great feeling. And as you, the more you learn that that leapfrogging starts to do this, starts to level off, and those leapfrogs come further and further apart, you know, and, but you also have amassed this in this entire library of techniques and, uh, and, and ways of doing things that actually in my, at least in my case, cloud my judgment constantly where I'm like, I can do, I can, you know, and finding the right one, you never, you know, is, can be a chore, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in a way, as you just said, the more you learn, the 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 most the more difficult it is because you have more techniques, you have more tools, and of course, as an artist, boom, 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 I can do it this way. When you start, is one, two, three ways. When you have a long career, it's fucking fifty ways. Yeah, it's never ending, you know. And and that's the thing that I that I got from teaching with the Illustration Academy, you know, is that what was so refreshing. We had Mark English and those guys, I was Gary Kelly and these guys, they're never satisfied. Mm -hmm. They're constantly a student, you know, and open to anything new, you know, and constantly searching for inspiration from other artists, which mm -hmm. was, that was like, yes, you know, like that was great. They weren't just resting on their laurels and doing the thing they do. You know, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. And Carolina, see the, you guys, you artists, you know, as Bill told me the other day when she was making questions, it takes one to know one. <laughs> What's the technique you hate the most? I don't. Ah. I don't have one. Yeah. No, I, I love it all. Like, but the only time you hate is when it's not working right. <laughs> you know, it's like, I hate this, you know, and then so you put it aside and you do something else, you know. Felipe Brel is saying, what about, I'm not sure if, I know what he's talking about, but I'm sure you will know, George. What about some Flashman artwork? What is it? I know. Flashman? Flashman? The yeah. Character? Uh, clarify, please, Philip. We're a little lost. Uh, well, not, is that a did? Probably. Yeah. No, I don't know. I've never read that. Clarify, those please, Philip. Clarify. Oh, Philip. Uh, Felipe Gonzalez says, Wolverine next suke. I do talk about, a bit about this before, but he goes into more detail with the question. What's a great project with the story in, in terms of story and art? How how did it came to your mind? Um, how did you think about it? You know, your art is different uh, on that one than it is in past projects. Did yeah. you want to experiment and make something new? Well, you said that before. You always try to make something new and experiment. So, well, interestingly, that was an outgrowth of the Batman book mm -hmm. because, um, and there were aspects of the Batman book that were really enjoyable. And that was the the Vietnam stuff that I was drawing, especially because I was doing pen and ink with uh, charcoal and sailboat varnish and all this goofy stuff, you know. And but what was happening on the Batman book too was I was doing these drawings, preparatory drawings for the panels, because at that point I was still doing boards, you know, pages, and uh, I would do these pencil drawings. And I was being really direct with the pencil and I was really enjoying it. I was loving just drawing. And, but then I, but, but then there was this disconnect because I had to take those drawings 
and then I would uh, transfer them to the boards and then I would paint them. And I felt like I was, I was losing something, you know, because the, the drawings were so free and so direct. And I wanted, and what I really wanted the Batman book to be was more graphic, mm -hmm. not in terms of like graphic violence, but, but just graphic, you know, Batman's not real to me. Right. So I wanted it to be more graphic and, and by, I guess, in you know graphic design graphic art you know and uh but but the editor really wanted me to do nmeas and i was just it was this constant battle of wills so when i got to so then i'm walking down this is before i moved out of new york and i was walking down the street in park slope and chris claremont lived down the road from me and i bumped into him and he goes oh he goes hey i've just been i've just been made the editor of the editors at marvel i was like oh man that's all that's awesome you know and, uh, and then I, I started like sort of vomiting this angst about Batman that I was, that I was the struggle I was having with my editor. And he said, well, he goes, I don't understand. He goes, why don't they just leave you alone? Let you do your book. And I'm like, and he said, come to Marvel, come work for Marvel. And I've never done uh, sequential work for Marvel. I just did covers. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I said, really? He goes, we will leave you totally alone. And uh, I said, well, I said, uh, and I knew Chris was uh, protective of Wolverine. And I said, well, could I do Wolverine? And he goes, absolutely. And I was like, okay. And that was a Friday. And uh, and I said, well, can I come in on Monday? He goes, yeah. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so, uh, and I can, like I said, I'd been reading all this Japanese literature, you know, uh, Lafcadio Hearn, the ghost stories and, you know, all this stuff. And so in my, my memory, of, I read Wolverine in high school and I read Wolverine. Uh, my, my favorite was the Chris Claremont, uh, Frank Miller. And so that was the extent of my knowledge of Wolverine at the, and Weapon X and stuff. But, you know, and I and so I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do Mariko. You know, I want to go back to that, you know, and then I, in the comic shop that was downstairs for me, they're like, oh, no, Mariko's dead, man. I'm like, what? They're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She got poisoned and whatever. I'm like, oh, no. And I was like, oh, but wait a minute, that's perfect because now she can be a ghost and I can do a ghost story. Boom. So uh, so I took in a proposal that I was going to take him back to feudal. He goes to the ancestral home and then he gets flipped into feudal Japan. And, and Chris was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, and I'm like, well, I got two more years on Batman. And he says, well, that's OK. We're going to, you know, we'll do it. I'm like, all right. And so. But we didn't draw up contracts, but I had a, you know, a handshake deal and all that. And then uh, I moved out of New York. I got married, had a kid. <laughs> I was in North Carolina and uh, I was I just finished Batman and I was called Chris. And he goes, well, I got bad news. I'm like, what? He goes, I just got laid off. Uh, I'm not with, I'm not that anymore. And he goes, but you're in good hands. I've handed it to Joe Casada and everything's golden. He's going to baby it through. And then that with them, then I, I haggled with uh, Joe over the contracts and stuff. So, so in Wolverine, it was, I went straight with a pen on loose sheets of paper, mm -hmm. straight with a pen. And if it messed up, it's like, fine. I mean, how much time do I lose? I'll do another one, you know, straight with a pen. Then I did watercolor on top of that. And these are just in Canson drawing pads, you know, and then I did charcoal, for, for value uh, so I could work with local color and then turn form with charcoal and not have to get as involved like I did with enemy ace. I could just, and man, it was such a joy. I just enjoyed drawing again. And then I would scan those and then put the pages together based on my layouts, you know, at, in Photoshop, making pages, you know, and that was liberating because it was it, because I took I was scanning everything at a hundred percent, bringing it in and, putting it in this small format, they were huge. And I was seeing my work in a way, almost dispassionately, like an editor would see it. And so I would like, oh man, I was seeing things that I would, that I didn't come up with in my layouts. And I would, I would, I would go with it, you know? So it was like getting to be, it was almost like being a film editor, you know, uh, taking someone else's stuff and then chopping it and playing with it. And that was really cool. And Marvel did, they, I, I didn't have to show any layouts I didn't have to show any sketches except for covers. Mm -hmm. uh, everything they just—I just got to do it, and I packaged the entire book. I mean, I did all the writing, all the lettering, all the 
production and I sent them DVDs that went straight to the printer. Mm -hmm. so was like a, it was like, man, it was such an enjoyable experience. Um, yeah, it was, it was fantastic, you know. That's, that's amazing. Uh, oh, Felipe Brill uh, uh, clarifies the Flashman thing he said before. He says, Sir Harry Flashman novels, an anti-hero going through Victorian history. Yeah, I've never read them, but I know the Frazetta paintings mm -hmm. from the covers. Yeah. But yeah, it would, I, I should read one and see what it's, see what it's all about. I, I really love uh, the Bernard Cornwell um, Sharps series. Sharps rifles and all that. I got totally buried in that. But also, I I picked those up because of the covers because they had Herb Taus covers, mm -hmm. and that that see that made me read those, you know. And so yeah, Frazetta could do that for me, and I'll I'll have to pick one up. Yeah, uh, Felipe Gonzalez says uh, when I look at your art, I see so many artists that followed have followed your path, you know, in their work, but also diverge in different ways in different directions such as Ken Williams, Ashley Wood, John J. Muth, and others? Well, they, they we were all together. Uh, that's, yeah, they weren't following me. We we, were, we all came up together. Mark was there. Uh, we, you know, Kent, Mark Torello, John Van Fleet, Dan Klaus was my roommate at Pratt, um, Peter Cooper, um, who else, Mark? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Scott Hanna, you know, and then Mignola starting at the same time. So was Jay Muth, uh, Scott Hampton. Scott actually started before, you know, he, he, was, a, he was a little older. Um, but, yeah, but roughly we were all beginning at that same time. I remember meeting Mike uh, oh, yeah. at his first New York con, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, swapping artwork and everybody just being jazzed that we were all trying this stuff, you know. <laughs> well, I can show you all more sketchbook stuff while he's doing that. Let's see. Sure, what I got in here. Let's see. Oh, some life drawing at the school. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I was filling the space with uh, yes, yes, you're, you're a bad person because normally you, your answers take a lot longer and the <laughs> one I needed to take longer so I could find this yeah. <laughs> and I was like, ah <laughs> sorry about that guys I wanted to show this too go to his website you can get this you know yeah, and there's two versions, there's uh just signed or the or with a sketch in them. Mm -hmm. Do you get a drawing in yours or no? With the sketch. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Guys, with a sketch. Good, that one. See? Some of those paintings are still available. Aha, aha, aha. Just so you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm saving money to try to get, you know, the Tintin and the Hercules Tower in La Coruña. That one I told you. You know, that's when I get when I save enough money, I'm going to get that one from you. Well, what, what, what is it? The, the one you the one you uh, you showed before, you know, the Tintin and uh, Tintin and the police tower. The one they might it's special for me because that's my hometown. Oh, that's cool. So, uh, as I told you, Madrid, when I, if, if you don't sell it before, when I save enough, cool. I will get that one. That um, was a great, that was a great festival, too. And man, I, you know, uh, Miguel Ancho Prado was was hustling me around, which was so cool. Mm -hmm. One of my heroes. Oh, sketchbook cover. Yep. 
I'm teaching you guys in purpose, so you buy them. <laughs> you know? And the rest I'm not going to show you because you need to buy them yourselves. The printing is really good on those too. I got I, I worked with. Uh, yeah, the printing is amazing. I remember when you when you showed it to me in uh, in Madrid, and I was like, "Yeah, so you see the level of detail." I there. saw that sketch right there. I just showed that one. That's funny. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's out of that one sketchbook. Yeah. This one. I bring on that. Okay, other stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go to the website. <laughs> um, uh, Felipe says, uh, Felipe Gonzalez says, many thanks for showing your sketchbook and art. Uh, I am waiting for your Kickstarter. Do you know when you're going to launch it? Uh, well, we're, she, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, Kasra and he's like, what about uh, September? And I'm like, it's not written in stone though. So, I mean, I've got to finish the African folktale mm -hmm. and the and the entropy strip and then uh and then it's then it'll be ready and I've, then i've got to get bill to write the uh introduction okay that will take only three years yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, sent him, I sent him the thing that i showed you so he's got a lot to to, to work with maybe so we'll see yeah just so you know you, <laughs> bill has been here before so you know i love his guts so i'm not just i'm just making fun um uh, oh, Paula Ventimiglia asks, do you teach online? Uh, sort of off and on with uh, Visual Arts Passage. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a guest on there. Um, John hit me up recently to actually do a uh, class on graphic novel, on sequential storytelling, mm -hmm. which I may or may not do. It would be a five-week course, um, but we'll see. Uh what is that you like teaching the most? Uh, sequential storytelling or painting, or both? Painting. <laughs> yeah, the sequential. The, the funny thing is, people that take my sequential thing, which I haven't taught for a while now at the school, but I, you know, I, I think they get kind of disappointed because I don't let them do finished artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like it's all about thumbnail. It's constant thumbnail and layout. You know, it's telling the story. And, uh, and they, I think they get really frustrated. I'm like, look, you know, cause one, the reason I do that is cause I don't want to, I don't want to butt heads with people that want to do manga or, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, uh, anime or whatever. It's like whatever, whatever you want to do, that's great, but you got to know how to tell a story, mm -hmm. what you do with it. That's your business. But yeah. I don't want to get over those stylistic choices and, and have to butt heads over that stuff. You know, that's just, cause that's just personal opinion and it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but, but you have to know how to tell a story and yeah. that, and that w the real work of these graphic novels and stories for me anyway, is the layout. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I agonize over the layouts and stuff. And then the, the finished art is, I mean, I, and I don't want to say it's busy work, but that's the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but when I'm doing layout, like I can't have music on, I can't have, I can't have anything going on. Like I have to focus and, and I go through, so many sheets of stuff, you know, and I, it, I mean, if you want, I can share the screen and show you that kind of thing. You know, I have a presentation. If you don't do it, the guys watching this are going to kill me. So, All right. so let, me, let me fire it up first. Let me quit uh, InDesign. And let me go to uh, Keynote. And then let me find the, let's see. You know, open recent. Let's see. Nope. I'm going to go to that. Keynote. All right. Open recent. Process. All right. So, do I have to share the screen again, right? I guess so. Yeah. All right. So, um, All right, so like I can show. All right, so now let's see, share screen. Okay. Window or screen. Screen. Allow. Oh. 
Huh. All right, so let's see. Process. Okay. Allow. Okay, so if I hit play, does that show up? Uh, layouts, yeah. It's in the screen saying layouts, so I'm seeing it. So this is uh, Enemy Ace. So there's the original Cubert, one of the gods. <laughs> the stuff I grew up with. And so um, this shows like layout stuff. I only see, I'm only seeing a screen saying layouts. Really? Okay, hang it's on. Not, it's, not, it's not changing, I don't know why. Yes, now it changed. Enemy Ace War Ideal. All right, so it'll, that's, that's weird. Um, oh, because it's, yeah, so I wonder how do I choose to share, um, let me go back to Firefox. Share your screen. Yeah, you just turn it off. Right. So share, select window or screen. How do I select screen? Uh, I, I don't know. I, in the bottom, in the bottom left is share your screen, and that's it. There it is. All right. That. All right. So this should let me hit play. Okay. Yes. Now it's changing. And that's the original cover we have for the book in Spain. The, the original yeah. edition. And that's the that's the sketch, yeah. and that that cover was a six foot oil painting. Whoa! And there's some of the reference I shot. <laughs> See my cardboard airplane. <laughs> uh, that is Scott Han Hanna posing. Um, and that's the only shot I took of the cover in process, but. Is is uh is Mark still online? Mark, Mark, <laughs> let me try to tag him. So these layouts, I went through tons of sheets to get to this point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask Mark because uh, I've got uh photos in here of my reference and whether he wants me to show that or not because he's in them. he's in the book i know <laughs> yeah but, and, but you are, book, and you are in batman houdini if i don't remember it wrong yeah but if it's okay to show the photos you know okay let me see if, if she if he answers i thought him on facebook so uh <laughs> carolina is saying i want to marry these paintings <laughs> That's uh, Herb Trimpey uh, and his uh, biplane, and he took me up in the Catskill Mountains so I could see what it was actually like in the old uh, fighter planes. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. And these are the models I built. That's John Van Fleet. Uh, he was my enemy ace. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from Mark? <laughs> no, not yet. I tag him so if he's uh, if he's watching, he'll see it. But no answer yet. So <laughs> careful. <laughs> yeah. And that is uh, oh, I can't believe it. I can't think of his name. He was a letterer, and Marvel played that character. No, John Workman, right? No. Uh, and normally I know his name, and I can't believe Jack. Uh, he do remember? It'll come back. Yeah, it's Jack, uh, Jack something. Mm -hmm. oh, let me check something here real quick. What are you doing? <laughs> you sorry, I'm like, you're, you're texting Mark? <laughs> uh, texting uh, this, this friend that's got this thing going on and trying to... Okay. So, Jack Morelli. Uh-huh. So, you haven't heard from Mark? No. All I right. Guess, I guess he fell asleep. 
So I'm going to skip this <laughs> to this. Oh, okay. Play. So this shows you like some of the reference I shot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the old man. So again, like photography was utilitarian for me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a, a means to an end. And again, like it's I, I, like when I work from photography, I don't project or trace, you know, I draw, I treat the reference as if they're in front of me, mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to look like, <laughs> but I, my eye is really on. So it looks like I'm on it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just eyeballing it. That's a little rough. And then the finish. Mm hmm. So let me go to uh, layout stuff more. So I have the Batman layouts here. Uh, oh, looks like they got turned off. Let me turn all this on. Wait, no, that's not. Oh, here we go. That's what it is. All right, play. So on the Batman layouts, I did. Uh, that's a eight and a half by eleven sheet, and I used a sharpie and just kept everything really small so that I wouldn't. Because, again, the layouts are not about drawing. They're about storytelling. So I didn't want to – I don't want to get caught up in drawing. So it's just shape, you know, uh, lighting, you know, uh, composition. Mm -hmm. And, again, like I go through multiple sheets to get to this place, you know. And then all the check marks – and red boxes are when I'm shooting reference, I'm checking things off and stuff, you know, so I know that it's been completed. And let's see, jump through here. So there's, and see the cover I got, they had a cross on it. They took it out. Mm -hmm. it must be a church. Um, so some of the finished art. My son had just been born and he became the devil child. <laughs> <laughs> And then for Batman's nightmare that he keeps having, that's I did them in uh, monotypes that I colorized. Mm -hmm. So different different techniques for different storytelling elements, right? Mm -hmm. To shift. Uh, so you to, again, like you were saying, like shifting when it happened, you know. Mm -hmm. and then what's next? Well, this is that Civil War story. Mm-hmm. And even then you can see like things shift a little bit from uh, what I laid out sometimes. And again, all these were done on separate sheets. And then each, I ha basically it's hand separations. So every color is a different drawing. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is my script, which I write. I don't break it up in pages. I just write the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then I go through on a print and just gut reaction to what I feel are the story beats and, uh, you know, pages. And even then I don't, I don't break that up into panels. It's like just pages. And then I figure the panels out when I'm doing my layouts. Mm -hmm. and then, like, let me jump out of here because that shows like sort of all the, some of the crud I went through just to get to those finishes. These are just like starts and things, you know, 
So here's, uh, let's see, covers. So Action Weekly, the finish. Doc Savage. The Doc Savage cover is, uh, I forget what the name of that is, but there's a, there's a group on uh, online that's comic original art collectors and Casra uh, just put this cover up for sale on there for me. Animal Man. And these were the, like I would go into DC, this is back when you could just go into DC and I would go knocking on doors mm -hmm. of different editors and say, hey, do you need covers? And they were like, what do you got? And I would run to the, <laughs> I would run to the copy machine and grab a bunch of paper out of it and sit down and do sketches and then take them in and show them to the editor. What about this? What about this? And I would go home with work, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what, how these worked. Uh, and then here's uh, Netsky layouts. Mm -hmm. so again, these were done just for me. The cover layouts I had to send in, but the storytelling was just for me. They never looked at any of that. Mm -hmm. So trying to come up with the best way to start it. And uh, I ended up choosing, if you remember, the long shot, which was more of an establishing shot, showing the ancestral home of Mariko. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that's where it's all going to happen, right? Instead of like right at the door. Mm -hmm. So again, you, as you can see, like the farther I get into it, the simpler they get because it's like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not about drawing. So trying to choreograph this fight scene, you know, so here's, here's like some of the loose stuff, trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here, like, uh, you know, like instead of that whole shot, I was going to zoom in on the nose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really got into hands and doing the whole tea service, tea ceremony. Mm -hmm. And then trying to play with this uh, vulture plucking this guy's eye out, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so uh, here's a great layout, right? There's this <laughs> this thing, horses and riders riding hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not even going to sketch it. And then that's the whole first issue of that, you know. And then these are cover roughs. There's the first cover. This one I really wanted to try and figure out, and I just couldn't get it to work for me. Mm -hmm. Where she was riding, riding him kind of, and her her hands had eyes on them, and it was like he was looking through her her eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up being this. Uh, let's see. Oh, and this this gives you an idea of the reference that I would shoot for Wolverine. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I was still shooting 35 millimeter at this point. Mm -hmm. My friend Tracy back here was the wind. Mm None of these people are professional models. They're they're people that, that I found on the street, basically. The 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 Asian Wolverine was uh, a barista mm -hmm. at one 
one of the coffee shops I went to, and he agreed to to be Wolverine. Um, she, Mariko, was the girl that my wife and I were in Wendy's. Mm-hmm. With our son, and she came in with a baseball cap, and she was covered in paint. And my wife and I looked at each other, and I was like, "Oh my god!" She was like, "Mariko." I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> Ran out. <laughs> hit her up, you know, and she was like, oh man, I'd love to do that. So this gives you an idea. There's a layout. And then this is the art on separate sheets of paper. And then they make a page. Mm -hmm. Shooting reference. So here's, this gives you an idea. Like that's kind of a shoot. More of it zooming in. This is uh, Scott Hampton posing for the Civil War story. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of my blues photos in the background there. Mm -hmm. Peanuts become bullets. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, let's see. There might be uh, Mark Trello in here. I don't want to. Let's see. All right. I'm Did sure you know. he will be fine, but you know what? There is a no story. Yeah. So here's uh, the Nazi zombie cover that I did. Mm-hmm. This is the reference that I shot. That's a procreate drawing. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Oh, there's that painting. And that's the reference that I used. Yes. He's my, well, he was, he's moved now, but he was uh, my entropy. Mm -hmm. And that story in pastel with the flowers that my children drew, he was the model for all that. Oh, there's the, that's the original drawing that I used as, uh, Sandman for the poster. Yep. And this is like, I do a lot of video drawing where I freeze frame movies and just draw. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to learn how to draw and to learn lighting and gesture and because they're, they're narrative images, you know, that's from Casablanca (laughs) glory. And see that found it, that one here found its way into the Civil War story. Mm-hmm. Dust Boot, Mountains of the Moon, Raise the Red Lantern, mm-hmm. Duelist, uh, The Lover, I think, Black, Black Death. Uh, cold, Cold Mountain. Duelist, the reader. Mm-hmm. Name of the Rose. <laughs> Sauna. Geisha. Memoirs of Geisha. Glory. Deadwood. Oh, these were student drawings. Mm hmm. We, I have them do this in class. Oh, these are good books on becoming a novelist. Mm-hmm. Eliza. Mark Torello. Yes. Mouse. Joe Kubert. Mm-hmm. Marvel. Studio Space. Anyway. 
<laughs> so then do I, do I hit stop? There we go. That was amazing. <laughs> and the people watching is like, in, I, I think they're in shock already. It's still that about how much you shot and I'm loving it. Anyway, it's been three hours already. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a daughter and a wife, especially, you know, my wife is probably going to kill me if I don't go back to them. Uh, but if, well, you guys, so if, you, if you guys, if you guys liked it and if you have liked it, George, we can repeat this. Uh, I, I could absolutely love it. Um, yeah. It's been so good. So please don't, we, so guys, we're leaving. I know you would want it to continue forever, but let's go back to our lives. Um, well, Jose and uh, I'm drawing a blank, Gerardo, right? I can't believe I can't think of the right. Thank you so much for coming to visit. <laughs> thank yeah. you all for being here. Have a nice weekend, you all. George, thank you so much. Please don't cut because I want to say proper goodbye to you after you know we cut the, the live feed. Um, but thank you. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed it, which is the most important thing. Blast. Yeah, it was great. And to all of you, have a really nice weekend. We'll be back on Monday with uh, the amazing Mark Brooks. Wear your fucking mask. Stay safe. Yeah. Not only that, keep everybody else safe. In Spanish, poneos la puta máscara. No solo protegéis a los demás, os protegéis a vosotros mismos, pero sobre todo a los demás. Be careful, stay safe, have a nice weekend, and again, wear the fucking mask. Be Bye. safe. <laughs> nice weekend to all of you. We're off in three, two, one.